All right, good afternoon, everyone. Today is June the 13th, and this is a meeting of the Planning Commission. So I just want to make sure that you knew you were in the right spot. Uh, the opportunities for the public to access and participate in the hybrid meeting are posted on the Albemarle County website, on the Planning Commission homepage, and on the Albemarle count, uh, County calendar. Participation will include the opportunity to comment on those matters for which comments from the public will be received. Uh, at this moment, I'll, I'll call the meeting to order and call for a roll call to establish the quorum. Uh, can we have a roll call, please? Mr. Moore? Present. Mr. Missile is not present today. Uh, Ms. Firehawk? Here. Mr. Carazano? Here. Mr. Bivens? Here. Mr. Murray? Here. Mr. Claiborne? Present. All right, so with that, we have established a quorum. As you look on the agenda today, we will be starting with a work session and then moving, therefore, to a, a public hearing. Uh, as a gentle reminder, we um, we typically do not have the audience engage with the during the work session. However, if you do have a comment, I will ask for you to come up at the next item on the agenda, which is other matters not listed on the agenda from the public, to share any comments uh, that you do have regarding the topic of the work session. And so I have a list here and I'll, I'll call you up uh, two at a time. Uh, as a gentle reminder, you'll have three minutes to speak. While you're here, the light will be green and you'll see that here on the uh, podium in front of you. It'll shift to yellow as time is approaching the end. When you see that yellow light, we'll just ask that you make your most pertinent points that you have if you have not already done so. And then when the light turns red, we'll, we'll kindly ask you to stop and let the next person speak. Uh, so the first two, uh, individuals that we'd like to have come up is Mr. Neil Williamson and Mr. Tom Olivier. And I apologize if I mispronounce anyone's name. Good afternoon, Neil Williamson with the Free Enterprise Forum. How many of you all have a cell phone? How many of you have two? How important is your connectivity to your every day? And how many of you can name one place, just one place in Albemarle County where that cell phone doesn't work just right? These poorly named dead zones are the indirect result of Albemarle County's outdated wireless technology ordinance. Tonight, you'll hold a work session focused on updating the zoning text to reflect today's technolo technological demands. The consultant's report on the county's condition is very approachable and features clear descriptions that even this liberal arts major can follow. The report calls out private industry and Albemarle's role regarding wireless infrastructure. And I quote, the county as a public entity can work to foster public-private partnerships to provide this much needed public resource, but ultimately is not responsible for proposing situating, designing, or building new personal wireless service facilities, close quote. Interestingly, the existing wireless policy itself dates back to about 1998. That was the same year Google was founded and long before it was a verb. How has your use of wireless technology changed in the last 27 years? This antiquated policy really didn't consider wireless technology as an infrastructure item. It was seen as a luxury. Today, Albemarle County businesses, residents rely on cellular service for their business operations, communications, and perhaps most importantly, safety. The answer to the primary question in the consultant's report, does the county desire to improve network coverage and capacity? We believe in the best interest of the health, safety, and welfare of the citizenry, the answer has to be yes. These recommendations will not solve all the problems, but if Albemarle County embraces the changes proposed in the consultant report, the Free Enterprise Forum believes private investment in the new technology will follow. And perhaps we no longer will have to ask, can you hear me now? Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Tom Olivier. And if you're reading from a script and you happen to run out of time, feel free to email uh, the document to the Planning Commission so we can see it in its entirety if you don't already right. do so. Thank you, Mr. Claiborne. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Tom Olivier, and I live in the Samuel Miller District. The Code of Virginia, Article 3, says 
The local planning commission shall prepare and recommend a comprehensive plan. The code does not say planning staff and consultants will develop a comprehensive plan. I've taken part in past county comprehensive plan updates beginning in the early 1990s. I recall work sessions decades ago in which chapter updates began with commissioners reviewing existing chapters page by page, discussing areas in need of revision and conferring with attending planning staff on possible revisions. At these sessions, the public often was allowed to offer views on existing texts and propose revisions. I believe that the symbioses evident then between the commission staff and public were key to the appearance of much enlightened thinking in county plans in the 1990s and early 2000s. Today, we live in a world marred by worsening ecological crises led by human-caused climate change. Climate scientists warn we must mend our ways and rapidly transform modern human societies if we're to survive climate threats. Analyses and documents produced so far by the AC44 team show little recognition of the scale of ecological crises we now face or how existing policies contribute to our woes. We are on course to develop a new comprehensive plan that cannot guide us through the disrupted environmental conditions projected for the next 20 years. We need an immediate overhaul of the current comprehensive plan update process. We need a process that once again draws on intellectual resources offered by the planning commission and planning staff and engaged knowledgeable members of the public. We are most likely to achieve this, I believe, with you, the Planning Commission, holding the reins on the remainder of the update process, in keeping with past county practice and the spirit and letter of Virginia law. I ask that you consider my comments in your discussion of comprehensive planning later this evening. Thank you. All right, thank you. The next two individuals will be Ms. Lori Schweller, Mr. John Foster. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Commission. I'm Lori Schweller, attorney with Williams Mullen. I would like to express my support for the suggestions made in the consultant's memorandum regarding the wireless zoning text amendment. These are reasonable modifications that would make a big difference in the quality of wireless service we experience in the county. My colleague Valerie Long and I have probably uh, obtained approval for at least 75 of the roughly 150 macro sites in the county. So I bring you these comments uh, based on our experience with the existing zoning ordinance. First, in the past five years, every site that we've applied for was accompanied with a special exception for antenna standoff, standoff and those were always approved. That's a, that's a change that can't really be noticed from the ground, but would make a, a lot of difference um, to service provided avoidance areas. In the 2015 ordinance amendment discussions, that was one of the first things that the industry uh, highlighted was how avoidance areas hold them back from providing um, the service they need. Um, the staff does not um, relax its careful scrutiny of any sites, whether they're in the avoidance area or not, um, but it, it converts a tier two facility to a tier three, and that means special use permit, community meetings, public hearings at the planning commission and board. So eventually those sites may get approved, but they take a lot longer. Uh, recent case in point is the site in Greenwood where we started with a tier two style facility, um, but over the course of over two years, we had so much debate, we ended up with a different facility that I think some on this commission and the board thought was not as preferred as the original site. These barriers are counterproductive to providing the level of service we want in the county, and these suggested changes can make it financially viable for wireless providers to make needed investments. Keep in mind that developing, doing the due diligence, the construction costs for a 100-foot monopole 
is not that different from a 130 foot monopole, but you get so much better service as the consultants have shown with the prop map, propagation map in the, in the memorandum with the 130 foot, just as an example. Um, and, and being able to construct that 130 feet and serve more customers gives the carriers a much greater return on investment. So you have that additional infrastructure investment in the county. We thank you for holding this work session, the kickoff meeting March 7th, and we really hope we can have one or more roundtable discussions with the industry so we can provide more information um, as you think about these ideas uh, going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Schweller. Next up is Mr. John Foster. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is John Foster, and I live in the Batesville Historic District in Albemarle County. Um, I was extremely concerned by the memo the county consultants have written recommending almost 500 additional cell towers throughout Elmar County. It's as if Verizon and AT&T crafted these recommendations specifically for their interests. I'm confident Albemarle County planning staff and elected officials heard the displeasure surrounding proposed cell towers in Batesville and Greenwood communities over the past few years. The community consensus in each case was decidedly opposed to new cell towers. While I understand the desire for improved cell cover, improvement in cell coverage throughout the county, the current level of coverage does not constitute an urgent public, public safety concern. Instead of relaxing the current regulations, the county should maintain the requirement for a maximum tower height and a taller than 10 feet taller than the tallest tree or nearest tree, maintain requirement for tree screening, require a setback of at least 1,000 feet from any additional historic district contributing structure to a historic district or structure listed in the National Register of Historic Places, require a setback of three times the tower height for any occupied structure and two times the tip height from any parcel line. I appreciate Avmar County's efforts to protect the scenic and historic resources through many of its policies and hope the Planning Commission will take this opportunity to improve its cell tower siting regulations to reduce the visual impact that future cell towers will have on Elmar County. Thanks for the time. Oh, thank you. Is there anyone else here present in the audience that would speak? Yes, please come forth. And please state your name and your association. Thank you. Hi, my name is Laura Good. I live in Whitehall, and this is in regards to the proposed wireless um, changes. Um, since this is the first time the consultant is communicating with the planning commission, um, I'll wait to be more specific about our concerns, but I represent a group of neighbors on Pea Ridge and Whitehall. And to give you context, in 2017, a cell tower was built basically in our backyards without proper notice. We were kept in the dark about the process. It, it was too late. Our supervisor even said it was a perfect storm, a lack of notification, lack of consideration for the immunocompromised family who lives right next to the cell tower, and a bunch of other things that we tried to address but ran out of time to do so. So um, we are concerned that the increase um, of in the report, um, they recommend existing towers can be increased up to 30 feet. So this would severely impact our views, our property values, our health, our quality of life, and it severely contradicts the goals of the Albemarle Comprehensive Plan. We do recognize the desire for personal wireless service, but this need is not universal. Our area has recently gotten high speed fiber optic in ground, which means that we do not have to rely on cell service solely for many internet related communications. The current cell tower in the middle of our neighborhood is full of families, agriculture, mountain and historic views. Many of us moved to this area for health reasons and to raise our children. We cannot choose which airwaves we breathe and are subject to and which ones we are not, but the county can. It appears as if the county is giving preference to the wireless companies and not to the health and welfare of its residents. Albemarle County was once considered at the forefront of keeping its historic and scenic characters safe from corporate interest. And we asked the county to listen to its residents and use caution in this manner. We respectfully urge the commission to listen to all of the potential negative effects 
And my neighbors and I would like to be somehow involved in the process. And we'd like to thank Bill Fritz for starting the process and we hope to be a part of it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on this matter that's here and present today? All right, please do come forward and state your name and association. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jeff Woodbury. I live on Birch's Creek Road in Batesville in the historic district. Um, I don't want to be here in the slightest, uh, but I am here because um, there is a 90 foot tall cell tower that's going to get built 90 feet away from my property line, about 120 feet off of my front porch. Um, the When I saw that the, they were going to consider, you know, changing the guidelines or revisiting the guidelines, I was surprised to find out that the recommendation was to lessen them. I kind of felt like that would be going the opposite direction. Um, so like my neighbor John said, you know, let's let's think about the people that are going to have to live in the shadow of these towers. They're not necessarily the property owner, uh, the neighbors. You know, I, I never my wildest dreams could did I think that there was, you know, even the possibility of a cell tower getting put 90 feet off of my property line, that I was going to have to play, you know, games in my front yard under the sh shadow of this tower. Um, I live in a historic district in a rural area. I don't live there because I like to upload stuff to TikTok. I live there for the scenic beauty. It's where, you know, we've been for a long time. We own our house, two houses next door that my family lives in. Uh, the fact that all of them are getting affected by this um, is, is, has been a huge deal for my family for the last year. Um, and it's something that we never saw coming. Um, so I hope that you give as much consideration to the taxpayers and to the property owners in Albemarle County that might not be, you know, working for cell phone companies. Uh, and that you just remember that the, this county is special for a reason. Um, and that we need to, we need to keep that in mind going forward. Uh, thanks for the time. All right. Thank you, Mr. Woodbury. Next. Can you hear me? Okay. Do I, oh, do I hit the button? Oh, no, no, you're good. Okay. Thank you. Um, good evening. Thank you for allowing us to speak uh, our thoughts on cell tower planning in Albemarle County. Um, my name is Ryan Woodbury. That was my husband. And I live in the historic district of Batesville. My home will be 120 feet from the imminent Verizon and Miller School cell tower. Uh, you've probably heard by now that the Department of Historic Resources ruled in favor of Verizon during the 106 review, determining that the Miller School Tower would have no adverse impact on the Batesville Historic District, despite unanimous community objection. And even the Miller School sided with the community and requested Verizon to move the tower to a less intrusive location. But Verizon said no. Um, I'm pointing this out because despite our best efforts, and the clear negative effect this tower, this tower will have on our community, Verizon doesn't care. All it would take to make Batesville feel better about this situation would be to move the planned tower off the road and 100 more feet into the woods. That's all. But Verizon said no. No one is allowed to access the proprietary coverage maps that supposedly support their reasons for saying no. So there's that. It's up to the Board of Supervisors and the Planning Commission to protect rural Albemarle and to look out for everyone's best interest. Connectivity is not the only thing that matters to the residents here. The setback regulations and height restrictions need to be stronger with regards to residential neighborhoods, historic districts, and property lines that are nearing or near neighboring homes or businesses. Every tower should be thoughtfully and individually considered by the surrounding community. Individual landowners should not be allowed to lease their land to providers with complete disregard for the neighbors. All of the property values along Birch's Creek Road, where we live, will be diminished because of this tower, while Miller School isn't affected at all in the least. So please do more to protect us and strengthen our regulations. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here and present that would like to speak on this matter or any matter that's not listed on the agenda? Okay, seeing none. Uh, Mr. Clerk, is there anyone online that would like to speak? No, sir. All right. Thank you. We'll move to the next item on the agenda, which is our consent agenda. 
there are no items on the consent agenda. So scrap that. We'll strike that from the docket. Um, all right, next is our work session. So with that, I'll call Mr. Fritz to the podium for ZTA 2023-00002 Personal Wireless Service Facilities. Thank you very much, um, Bill Fritz, Community Development Department. Um, I have a role here of two things. One is to introduce our consultant, Susan Ribold, who uh, works with Cityscape. She's, she uh, and uh, the Berkeley Group prepared the presentation and information you have before you tonight. And uh, there are questions at the end of the memo that you have. They're also in the presentation. And that's where we really want to get to today. Uh, we want to get your feedback so that we know what the next steps are um, and move forward. My second role is technical, and that's to load the PowerPoint presentation for her. And apparently I have already messed it up. Where's our? It's coming. I don't know how I did that. I hear. How'd I do that? <laughs> yeah, I've never seen that one before. Ooh, this could be fun. No. You don't need to do that again. Yeah, I think I covered it. So well, I'm not sure about that. All I did was click the. Receiving uh... minutes for a password. It's not supposed to be auto logs in. Do you have another copy of this presentation on the flash drive? Mm -hmm. One of the laptops? Could I set you up right here just for your knowledge to fix this? Mm I can run it from here if you want to get started, or we can wait a second to see if she can get it loaded up there. We can move forward. Good evening. Thank you for having me this evening. I'm Susan Raybald with Cityscape Consultants. And next slide. <laughs> We are a company that, next slide please, that exclusively works with local governments. We do not work for a service provider, tower owner. We do not provide site acquisition for the wireless industry. We do not build sites. We do not own a subscription service for uh, people to subscribe to. We just work for local entities on wireless telecommunications. We have been uh, hired to provide an engineering analysis for the county through the Berkeley Group. And our project includes the preliminary research of all of your wireless equipment. We did an assessment of all of those sites. We physically went to all of the antenna locations, all 180 
nine of them, I believe. And we took images, we recorded data that was there, and then we mapped all of that out. We provided a project initiation meeting that discussed the scope of the project, took a little bit of comment from that meeting, and then we finalized the inventory catalog, which is a document that provides images of each site, the data that we collected, and accompanies the maps that we prepared. We're at the engineering mapping and analysis piece on our scope of services, and that's what I'm going to present to you now from this meeting will be additional feedback from you all and the community. And from those comments, we'll be working on the uh, if those comments warrant uh, text changes, then that will occur at that later date. And then we'll put together those recommendations if they come out, or we'll just finalize the analysis and provide it back to you. So I wanna start with a brief introduction to wireless communications. This will go quickly, but I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page with regards to the type of infrastructure that we are discussing this evening. The wireless communications project that we're working on is specific to cell phones. It is not regarding broadband cable services. And you may recall that first generation wireless was like a bag phone back in the 80s, which transitioned to second generation wireless for your uh, high frequency service providers. That transitioned to third generation, which brought on a new type of a handset. And fourth generation now is where the industry is, 4G LTE moving into 5G. The first, second, and third generation platforms have been retired. And so those networks that were built in that range are no longer provided. However, the industry does use that base platform for 4G. So they didn't have to go in and rebuild structure. They just changed out antennas and hardware and software in order to transition to 4G. You have um, the handsets that are multi-platform or multi-app uses. So in order for those handsets, those smart devices to work, they require more infrastructure than what you needed in first, second, and third generation wireless. And so that's why you'll continue to see the need for more infrastructure going forward because those devices require the need for more antenna in order to operate and function at um, optimal um, services. Just a few quick facts that the 76% uh, of travelers say they, re they rely on their mobile phone for travel and getting directions. You have 85% of photos uh, taken that were captured on smartphones, 33 or 330% of, of uh, handheld smartphone uh, subscribers say that they use their phone for health and fitness apps. And you had over 49%, we have over 49% of the households that say they've cut their landline and they're using their smart devices as their primary form of communications. And you have an, a large majority of calls made from 911 coming from your handheld devices. Next slide. So the way this works is for seamless connectivity, you need to have your antenna for these handsets mounted above tree lines, ridge lines, rooftops. The more of those types of items that are between the antenna and the handset or between antenna for handoff, the more degradation you have to the system. And I'll talk a little bit more about that momentarily, but the antenna need to be 
elevated above those structures in order for them to optimize their propagation pattern. Originally, you had the macro cells mounted on these structures of towers or base stations. And as your urban areas begin to spread out into the county, you'll start, I think, to see small wireless facilities. Charlottesville, we haven't, in Charlottesville presently, we haven't seen the deployment of small wireless, but I expect that they will start to see deployment of small wireless and that that small wireless network will probably move out of Charlottesville into some of your surrounding uh, areas in Albemarle County. And those small wireless facilities are used to help densify the network. Your range of propagation pattern from your macro cell is much farther than a small wireless facility. Small wireless facilities are three, 350 feet to at most a quarter mile, at most. And that's if there are no buildings, treetops, and topographic <clears throat> barriers to that signal. And so going forward, you'll see a combination of macro and small and those more densely populated areas. Next slide, please. So to familiar air, familiarize everyone. These are examples of your macro cell towers. They are guide or a monopole or a lattice tower. These are all images taken from our assessment and those site numbers are what's shown by, for example, A24, A83, and A75. And examples of semi-concealed and concealed macro cells. The previous slide was all non-concealed. Examples of semi-concealed are A20, where you're, we consider that a semi-concealed. I know that the county considers those concealment elements, but we refer to them as semi-concealed because you can still see the antenna. And in some cases you can see the coax cable, but they're painted brown, so it blends in more with the landscape. An example of a fully concealed macro cell site would be A92, your faux tree. You can barely see that antenna because it is covered, it's painted green and covered with faux branches, and you cannot see any of the coax cable. And then site O, meaning outside Albemarle, but within a one mile perimeter, O3, is a fully concealed macro cell where you don't see the antenna at all, nor do you see the coax cables. Now, a base station is a is when the antenna mounts on a facility that wasn't built for the sole purpose of wireless communications. So the towers before you saw previously, those were built for the sole purpose of mounting the antenna. These structures, the water tank, the rooftop, the high tension tower, those were not built for the sole purpose, but they are locations that antenna can go on. And so those are considered base station by um, the FCC's revised definitions. So these are examples of non-concealed antenna attachments in the county. These are examples of semi-concealed base stations. For example, this A108, the high tension tower was painted brown and the antenna are painted brown. Those are concealment elements. The antenna on the rooftop or the wall, excuse me, on A104 are painted and they are below the elevation of the rooftop. So you don't see them protruding above the rooftop. And A53 is a, behind those louvers, is a concealment structure at this facility where all the antenna are behind there. And you have at least three service providers at A53. Non-concealed uh, small wireless facilities and concealed wireless facilities are shown here. These are examples of small wireless facilities in other jurisdictions. So the, the images on the left and in the middle are antenna, small cell antenna attachments onto uh, utility distribution poles in the right of way. And the image on the right is an example of a utility pole type structure 
that was built with the antenna shrouded and all of the cabling inside the pole. The small or the box, I should say, to the right of on the ground is a small shroud around the ground equipment that supports that antenna on the facility. With regards to location, we do an analysis on where these facilities are. Are they on public property? Are they within the utility easement? Are they on private property? These are examples of those facilities on those classifications. Next slide. So as far as the mapping goes, this is, we provide five infrastructure maps. The first one is infrastructure by inventory structure type. So you have 164 towers and you have 25 base stations. The towers are identified by the black dot. The base stations are identified by an empty dot, a clear dot. Inventory antenna type. This is identifying that you have 147 macro cell facilities. 17 are broadcast only facilities. You have three public safety facilities. You have four public safety facilities that also have macro cells on them. You have no small wireless facilities. And then you have 18 other, they could be microwave, they could be un unidentified types of antennas. And I wanna point out that on these maps, you have the Albemarle County boundary in the dash, longer dash line. And then in the tiny dotted dash line, that is a one mile perimeter. And we try to include facilities within the one mile, because if we didn't include them, it would perhaps distort the propagation, well, it would distort the propagation pattern. So we include those even though they're just outside the, excuse me, even though they're, so I'm sorry, got a little distracted. One mile perimeter to include those sites are sh shown. Okay. Control now. All right, there we go. You got it? I do, thank you very much. Although you are doing a great job, <laughs> but thank you. All right, and then these are just your personal wireless service facilities. And of those 150, you have one that is proposed and under review and three that are approved but not built yet. You have 161 on private property. You are using public property. You have 14 on public property. Public property includes county owned, school owned properties. You do not have any in the right of way, and you have 14 within the utility easement. With regard to design type, you have seven that are completely concealed in the study area, 102 semi-concealed, and 80 that are non-concealed. And then I just provided a summary inventory that you can look at at your convenience. So we take that information and we provide you simulated uh, propagation prediction maps. We do not claim to provide you exact propagation patterns because the exact propagation pattern can only be provided by the actual service provider. They have proprietary information. We're not even gonna ask for it because we won't get it. But our goal here is not to focus on where the service is great, but really where the coverage is not. And then to address, you know, do you, to answer the, and then we ask you the question, do you want to fill that area? And if the answer is yes, we have some, just some, some suggestions for your consideration. So just to let you know, we use a standard antenna model for our propagation standard. We use the an average mounting elevation. So if a site was approved, for example, 100 feet, we go down to 80 because typically you have equipment in the range from the top down to the bottom. And if we were just to focus on the very top of the antenna, we would not, or for the, the top of the mounting antenna, we would not have a, a, an accurate read for any equipment below that. 
So we, we drop down. We also take into consideration the topography. We take into consider clutter. Clutter includes the trees, the types of trees, whether they're deciduous, coniferous, whether they're um, there's ridgelines and buildings. And the clutter that we purchase for this area includes building structure type. So if it's concrete versus wood, and that's all built into our clutter model because that's all very important with regards to how the signal can actually get into a building to provide in-building coverage. So this first map I'd like to share with you is a simulation showing predicted coverage from every wireless facility, all 150. And it's assuming that every service provider is at each location. We do that as a starting point so that if you were able to have co-location on every facility, what would your best build out model look like? The yellow represents cell coverage strong enough to get inside a building. Your green shows an average coverage, which is not necessarily going to be in a building. It might be, depending on the structure type and type of windows on that building, but you would definitely have strong enough coverage to operate inside a vehicle. The blue area represents really coverage outdoors. You may or may not have coverage sometimes indoors, maybe, but you would definitely probably have it outdoors if you're standing in the right location. Any area without coloration from any of those um, signals represent your dead zones, your gaps in coverage. Now, we know from our assessments that not every service provider is on each of those sites. So the next series of maps are theoretical coverage prediction maps by individual providers. But we don't tell you who the provider is because we're not trying to promote any particular service provider's pattern. Our main objective here is to show you that certain providers have a stronger footprint and certain other providers have a smaller footprint. You have five service providers. You have AT&T, Dish Wireless, T-Mobile, Verizon, and US Cellular. All five service providers are allowed through Federal Telecommunications Act to provide service in their area. And you have to look at, in our opinion, we encourage you to look at the smallest footprint because you need to allow them to have the same access as the provider who has the greatest footprint. So this next slide is showing the comparison between one of the providers that has a more uh, complete build out plan, whether you would call that complete or not because there's still a lot of gap areas, but in comparison to one of the providers that has a smaller foot out, footprint, plan just to give you um, a comparison. So let me back up. When we look at this, we part of our, our next set of analyses is from an engineering perspective to look at your current development standards and to see what kind of an impact the development standards have on the propagation pattern. And so that's what we do next. I first started looking at your comprehensive plan, which was um, provided in 2000 and then amended, I believe, in 2015. And these are 10 bullet points in the comprehensive plan about the goals and objectives for citing your personal wireless service facility sites and made into public policy. Then I moved into looking at your county code. And as was referenced by some of the attend or speakers previous to me, you have tier one, two, and tier three development standards. And 
all personal wireless service providers can go in a tier one or tier two by right and through the special use uh, process for tier three, except in the Monticello Historic District. Yes. Just a quick question uh, for the different tiers. What separates them? Are you about to cover that? What separates them? So. I am. But feel free to ask questions I go, as I go along. I should have mentioned that earlier. So a tier one facility meets or includes the comprehensive plan guidelines of being disguised to minimize visibility and to utilize existing structures where possible. So for example, A70 and A100. Uh, A70 is an example of attaching onto an existing structure provided there's no microwave. And then a tier one is also allowed provided that you can't see it at all. And those are faux dormers on that rooftop whereby the antenna are situated behind. So you don't see them. So that is considered a tier one. Those are examples of tier one facilities. You can also replace an existing wood pole with a metal wood pole provided the base is not more than 30 inches in diameter and it tapers to the top at 18 inches. A tier two facility supports um, these three goals and objectives of the comprehensive plan, that the antennas are mounted close to the supporting structure. They're limited in size to be in keeping with the characteristics of the area and that they uh, do not uh, interfere with the skyline with looking up at the facility. And they need to be a treetop facility, which means that, and they have to be outside of the avoidance area. So a treetop facility is a personal wireless service facility that is on a structure that is not more than 10 feet higher than the tallest tree within 25 feet of the proposed facility. And I just want you to look at the image on the left. Can you find the tower? It's really hard to find. That this, this code really does um, keep the visibility of the tower down significantly. It's actually, the tower is actually sort of behind the uh, cable identifier. So you see the cable box and the white pole with the orange around it. Behind that and behind the fence line is the image of the, it's where the tower is. And if you look on the right, that's taken from a different angle on the opposite side, and you can see the monopole in the, oh, here, I'll help you. I'm afraid to use the cursor, but here's the monopole. So it's actually right here. You can sort of see the antenna right there. There's the monopole. And then if you go to the other side of the site, here's your monopole and here's your antenna here. So your treetop facility standards and appear to be very, efficient. I was happy that we did the assessments in the winter because it would have been very, very hard to find them with vegetation on the trees. Your avoidance areas are, so those are examples of your treetop facilities, and then you have your avoidance areas. And the first avoidance area we're showing here are your mountain protection areas where the personal wireless facilities uh, have to not be skylined. And those are the areas in pink. To that, we add the avoidance areas um, are the agricultural and forestal district. And those are sort of the yellow coloring. And your historic districts are also avoidance areas. And those are the areas identified in kind of the peach red. And then along your scenic highways and byways, for example, here, 
you have a 200 foot area to be observed. And that's shown here in these white areas along the right, those rights of ways. Now your tier three facility is for service facilities that are neither a tier one or tier two. And in the last seven years, you've had eight approved. Now your county co-development standards have four standards that I want to go over with you. One is that you have the number of antenna arrays are now allowed to exceed three. The size of the antenna is not allowed to exceed 1400 square inches. The projection of the antenna from the structure that it attaches to, um, in no case shall the farthest point from the back of the antenna be more than 18 inches from that facility. And then the color needs to match the facility or the building of the antenna and the equipment. So I wanna talk now about the deployment pattern based on those policies. First of all, your avoidance areas, uh, Albemarle County is the number that we have is 725.979 square miles. And collectively, your avoidance areas, your Ag Force District, your historic districts, your mountain protection areas um, encompass 48.38% of your land mass. And when if you want if you add the Shenandoah National Park because it's highly highly unlikely that there would be any facilities approved in that area, that's another 3%. And so it puts you just over 51% of your land area in the county into an avoidance or very much like like Shenandoah National Park, almost like an avoidance area. Could I make a very short comment? Mm -hmm. um, just I wonder if in your comment, you said that um, this is based on our policy, but it's also based on the market. So some of the areas that we're showing in pink are also very lightly populated. So if we were to just wave our magic wand this evening and say, um, come on down to Southern Albemarle, it's all open. Um, mm -hmm. I, the, the, I don't know that you would have the rush of cell towers down there. So I'm just saying it's not just policy, right? It's Correct. also population that makes it economically viable. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So as I mentioned, your treetop policy, definitely one of the pros because it, based on your comprehensive plan, goals and objectives, the treetop tree policy definitely provides the visually hidden facilities. They're not nearly as visual as some of the others. Uh, the challenge from the treetop from an engineering perspective is that that propagation pattern cannot travel as far because the antenna is lower and it, those trees are gonna continue to grow and even 10 feet below the elevation of the antenna provides canopy because they have to be 10 feet above that canopy. But that canopy, even if it were 10 feet below when it's first constructed, still absorbs and reduces the propagation signal from that antenna. So what you see in the field is that you have multiple antennas on multiple individual poles on the sites because these poles that are lower are not conducive to having co-location. So each service provider needs their own pole. You have a the standard that I mentioned that your ordinance has, you shall not exceed three antenna per array. And the challenge with this from an engineering perspective is that in the early 90s or late 90s, when first generation was deploying, those service providers only operated in the low megahertz frequency, 800 
primarily, 800 range. Second generation was the deployment of, at that time, which was called high frequency, 1800. And at the second generation, you either had service providers that operated in the low or the high. Then with third generation wireless, you saw providers operating in both frequencies. And so now those service providers needed another set of antenna arrays to operate in the low and the high. So no longer did they just need three antenna, they started to need six antenna. Some of them now transitioning obviously out of four or into 4G, you're seeing them operating in the low frequency. That 800 megahertz frequency is now no longer high frequency, it's mid-band because 5G is transitioning into a higher frequency range so now you see most of the providers operating in three different bands of spectrum. Typically, the low and mid bands are in one set of three antenna arrays, and then your 5G is in a second set of antenna arrays. So you have the need on these single tenant poles for them to occupy two sets of antennas around that pole. So you then really eliminate any possibility of operating a co-location because that lower antenna array is typically right at the tree line. That's what we observed in the field. And you have um, 124 of your 142 personal wireless service facilities are single tenant facilities. And that's because of what I just explained to you. Additionally, another challenge from an engineering perspective that the industry has is one of the, they use remote radio heads or remote radio units to boost their signal and to help with capacity on, on sites. Ideally, those remote radio units are as close to the antenna as possible to maximize the boost from that remote radio unit onto the antenna that they can get. So they have to make a decision. Some of your, some of these poles have the two sets of antenna array as shown on this site. They've got probably their lower mid band on one of these arrays and then they are high on the 5G band on the other. This site is an example of how they put the remote radio unit right below the antenna. They can't put them behind the antenna, which is really ideal because of the distance that you have, they can't exceed 18 inches from the back of the antenna to the pole. There's not enough room for them to mount the antenna and the radio head and have the coax and the other cables that go to those antenna to, that can't fit there. So they have to mount them below. Alternatively, for this provider, because they don't have the remote radio units with their antenna, they put them on the ground. So we see a lot of sites that have actually put their remote radio units on the ground, which is an alternative, but we estimate that it reduces the signal, the potential signal by 30%. So if the antenna were up at the top, they would have 30% more coverage than being down here at the ground. Another development standard you have, as I mentioned previously, is that the size of the antenna cannot exceed 1400 square inches. This is an example of a JMA 4G LTE antenna. It's an eight port antenna. It can accommodate more bands of spectrum, but which is great because it might be able to reduce the number of antenna, but we can't dictate what kind of antenna you can use. That gets into their business decision. But if a provider wanted to provide this antenna, 
it exceeds the 1,400 square foot dimension by 20 square inches. So um, I think as one of the speakers mentioned, they would have to request a, uh, what is it built? Is it a, it's not a variance, a special exception in order to, to use this type of antenna. Your projection of the antenna with the maximum 18 inches from the back of the antenna creates a slim line look to the, to the facility as shown in site A07. Again, I think this is definitely less visual. I think um, that meets the comprehensive and policy objectives. There is an engineering challenge to this. Again, you have the remote radio units that are below and on the ground. Ideally, you would have the remote radio units right behind the antenna, like as shown on here. Additionally, your this type of antenna configuration allows the industry to beam tilt antenna. So if they're trying to provide coverage down a corridor, it gives them the flexibility to angle that antenna to beam tilt down into specific areas. Cannot do that on this type of a pole, but you can on this yard arm type of configuration. This type of configuration would require a special exception in the current code. This type of configuration also optimizes the use of being able to add both antennas and the remote radio units at the same level. And so instead of having them stacked as in this one, optimizing the distance that that signal can propagate. Quick question. Mm -hmm. so so is the one on the right an example of, of the six antenna array? Correct. That's the preferred number that they're carrying now. Um, that is a standard that we've been seeing for an, a couple of years now since they've started to deploy 5G. So in addition to our mapping that we do, we have dozens of, of clients around the United States that we do site reviews for. A lot of them don't have planning staff to do the reviews and so they contract out to us. So we see site reviews from East Coast to the West Coast, North and South. And so that's a pretty standard configuration that we see now. So these are both equal in terms of the number of the arrays and the antennas. They are. They're different configurations. Correct, yes. Right, so on this antenna configuration, you have a total of six antenna. They're stacked and mounted close. You have remote radio units here. This has the six antennas all at the top and the remote radio units are either right next to or right behind the antenna. So with regards to the monopole height, being 10 feet or less above the tallest tree within 25 feet, uh, the propagation pattern on some of these sites is really small. So this 30 foot uh, or 36 foot, excuse me, antenna mounted here, it's really just providing coverage to a very small area in the shopping center and business district. Conversely, the facility here in the power line has a number of advantages. One, it's much taller. It can provide a much farther signal. Oops, sorry. The power line is also in an easement and the easement is free of trees and vegetation. And so it can propagate farther because there's not all the vegetation immediately around it. And third, or I should say a third point to bring out is that while it might look like a great solution 
these these utility easements with these high tension wires, they're not everywhere. They're in a specific line. And so you can't just use those as your great alternative to having antenna go in there. The next thing that we want to look at <clears throat> from an engineering perspective, as um, as Firehook brought up, is the demographics and where people reside in the county. The majority of Albemarle County is low density rural residential with less than 350 people per square mile. You have the smallest area of population is identified in this pale yellow area where you have no more than 50 people per square mile. And this is based on census block data that we um, are using. Your more highly densely populated areas are these darker shades. And this area in here, oh, you don't see the cursor, there it is, okay. This area in here is where you have up to 250 people per square mile. And so to your point that you brought up, most of your antenna are located in these more densely populated areas or, or and or along your major corridors. And you can see the propagation pattern from these antenna into these corridors and into these areas. This just gives you a, a summary of the number of facilities that you have now and the number of tenants that you have on them. So you have 81 of your facilities are single tenant poles, five with two, and those sites are typically below 100 feet. And what Cityscape did then was we were like, well, looking at how many providers are in single tenant poles, and again, this image here is assuming that all the providers are on each pole, which they're not. I probably should have shown another slide here that showed one of the least populated patterns. But we estimate if all the providers were going to improve coverage to most of the county you and continue with this deployment pattern, it would take about 125 poles per provider to cover the area. So you'd be looking at about 625 poles because you have five service providers. I want to clarify if it was ever communicated through anything that we wrote previously saying that we recommended 500 poles. That's, I want to clarify, that is not what we're saying. We simply were saying in this analysis, if you continue on this development pattern and you provide equal access to all providers, how many poles would it take under the current development pattern to provide complete or more complete coverage? We're estimating it would take about 625 poles. We don't recommend one way or another what you do. I just provide you this information. And I provide that too because most of our other clients that we've done this for always ask. So we provide it on the forefront. A quick question. So there, yes. there are multi-provider polls, right? There are a few multiple provider polls, yes. So what, what limits for all the polls to be multi-provider? Um, mostly your height limit prevents it from being a multiple tenant poll. Uh, like for example, you have 23 that are providing um, more than, um, well, let's see, I'm sorry. In, of the you have 23 towers that are 121 to 156 feet in height, and eight of those are multi-tenant um, outside of the utility easement. And then you have eight in the utility easement. And 
So you have very few with multi-tenant. When you look at that, you've got five that are two-tenant, three with two-tenant in the middle range. And it's really a result of the treetop canopy restrictions that you have as to why they can't be multi-tenant presently. Um, so the question that I posed or we posed to you is does the county want to uh, increase coverage across the county for providers and provide increased capacity? And if your answer is yes, then we provide you some options. And I want to apologize. I realized through the speakers that in the written part, we used the word recommendations in the analysis. I will change that to options. I did not intend, we did not intend to recommend anything to you, we provide you options. So I apologize for that confusion because that was definitely confusing, uh, but these are options. So one option to increase your coverage and capacity performance by 30% would be to increase your tower heights at your existing facilities. Wouldn't, so you wouldn't add more facilities at those locations, but you would increase the height of those facilities up to 25 or 30 feet. So we did an analysis because one of the service providers made a comment at the last meeting that we had that said, if, you, if we could just increase another 30% or 30 feet, we would increase our coverage area by X. So we did a fact check. <laughs> we wanted to see, okay, is that accurate? And so, for example, this is site A59, the service provider is at 99 feet. And the image in the upper right shows our theoretical coverage from that facility. And then we did an analysis that showed putting that antenna at 130 feet, so 31 feet above the 99, and it improved the coverage to over 1.3 miles from that existing facility. And so the net result would be an increase of 40% um, distance coverage and an increase of 90% coverage around the whole area. And that 90% includes all of this fill-in area in and around here that's not showing up on this map above it. Other options to improve uh, coverage would be to allow new towers to be constructed up to 30 feet above the tree canopy, because you, if you want to continue, if you want to encourage co-location, you've got to have more height. And so you could increase co-location, you could limit the number of poles by, improve, by increasing the height, because you could get two, three providers on a facility that's 30 feet above the tree canopy. If you want to, um, if you're not concerned about the number of poles, then you could go lower than that. But the lower you go, again, you reduce your coverage footprint. The Just a quick question. Yes. Um, there you go. Wondering, you know, with the signal propagation based on hat uh, in, in a large degree, uh, and with the co-location being sort of helpful for few overall poles, is there any consideration of going 40 or 50 feet above? We did not. Okay. We could if that's if you ask, but we were trying to go, like I said, we were kind of fact checking the industry mm -hmm. statement that they made at the last yeah. meeting. Yeah, yeah. Sorry if there's anyone in the industry that said that comment, but we wanted to see if there was a factual statement or not. And so we didn't go higher than that amount. The higher you go, though, you would 
gain more coverage and more color, but you'd have more visibility as well. Um, another suggestion would be to modify the number of antenna around each array to uh, increase the size of the antenna to being more than 1,400 square feet. And uh, that would allow beam tilt and increase your projections. Another option would be to, as you move forward, if you build more facilities for emergency management equipment, would be to plan and have wireless service facility options for co-location on those facilities. Because chances are, if you need to improve public safety in any geographic areas of the county, I don't know if you do, but if you do need to, chances are the industry would also need coverage in those same areas. And so you could uh, build those sites to accommodate both. Other suggestions would be to look at uh, altering the avoidance areas um, and to pre-design tier two facilities for concealed towers so that they wouldn't all have to be special use permits um, in each case of new facility. So the questions that we posed to you all to sort of see what your reactions are to the analysis would be, do you, would you agree to change the avoidance areas in the historic ag forest mountain protection areas by either eliminating or reducing them. I don't know, I'm just putting these suggestions out because over 50% of the area is avoidance area, or excuse me, just under 50% is avoidance area. Would you agree that you could increase the number of arrays or change the mounting standard from being a tight configuration to the yard arm type facility? Would you agree to change the dimensions of the width of those towers? Because I didn't mention this, I should have on one of the previous slides, as these poles taper to the top, you run out of room for the coax. So if you have a 30 inch base here, you have coax that by the time it gets up into this area, the 18 inches is so small, it's, it doesn't allow for many more coax cables to go in there. And that's another reason why you see remote radio units also on the ground because they don't have enough cabling to go in there. And so would you consider, or they don't have enough space for the cabling to go in there. So would you agree to change the dimensions of the towers to make it the same height at the top as you would at the base. Um, again, would you would, would you consider changing the treetop standard to allow higher facil taller facilities above the treetop? And um, do you agree that the distance from the reference tree should be increased? So, for example, maybe not twenty five feet, but maybe even or reduced or increased. I don't know, however you wanna read that. <laughs> um, and would you agree that if they, if you built into your code, pre-designed design development standards for concealed facilities, would you possibly agree to using the, having those installed as a tier two and not a tier three? But I just wanna caution you on a couple of things. Not all concealed poles are equal. So for example, I'm just gonna scroll back here super quick. Um, sorry, I don't mean to give you a headache or a migraine. There we go, oops. This concealed pole at 003, you're only gonna have one tenant there because that type of pole promotes the flush mount antenna whereas the faux tree allows for the yard arms, provided they're painted 
and covered in an antenna sock, or they have 3M faux branches applied to the antenna. So I just caution you that, you know, they're not, they're not all equal. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for the very informative presentation. Um, I think the short answer to a lot of those questions is it depends, right? right. Um, but before we get into that, I would like to see if any of the commissioners have a question on the materials you specifically have just heard before we get into those bulletized questions of the report. Right, Commissioner Bivens. This is just a, just to sort of have some idea. When you when you make it the um, the observation that one way to increase coverage is to go up is enhance the height mm -hmm. on the existing poles. Do you have a sense of what of what the engineering what that would require for engineering to be able to do that? Mm -hmm. So is that a is that a is that a um, um, an accessible solution? Or is it really a solution? If it, if it were an option, would that be an option that would be embraced? Or is that an option that people with that vendors would say, no, I really want to just want to get another poll? Okay, first response is not all the polls are going to be able to be increased in height without doing a replacement poll, like taking down the existing poll and putting up a new one. Because some of them are made out of wood, so it's going to be very hard to replace extend the wood pole. Some of them are tapered significantly to the top. And so those aren't going to be conducive. If you have, you do have some straight aligned poles that look like they might be able to have an attachment added to them to go up. But I'm thinking most of them are going to be drop and swaps, replacements. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be, I don't, I can't represent the industry. I don't know. But I'm thinking because they are the ones that made that suggestion at our public initiation meeting, that maybe that is a viable option for them. We just, like I said, we did the fact check to see if it did increase the way they said it did, and we found that it did. But I can't speak on behalf of the industry. Any other questions particular to the presentation? Uh, I have a couple before we, um, if staff could pull up the bulletized questions as well. Uh, I do have a couple. Um, Are these for me or for you to discuss? For you. I'm okay. sorry. For you, I apologize. Uh, throughout the process of gathering the data, I was curious if the public safety officials or as fire, police, emergency services, did they weigh in such as, I have problems serving this area because of X, Y, and Z? Just, was there any feedback? We have not services? gotten to that point. I'm, I'm sorry, we were oh, doing sure. some coordination here from the emergency services. Like anybody who serves in that area, did they we're, weigh in? We're we're coordinating with them as as part of this. So no, we don't have any specific comments, but they are a part of the process. We're working with the broadband office and them to um, make sure they're aware of this effort. And uh, but these are really very distinctly different exercises that we are working on. Um, we did not try to analyze what the emergency coverage was. So uh, we were really focused on the wireless. Yeah, I think what I'm, I think it would have been helpful to know uh, from a master planning perspective, right, where they saw issues that were we forthcoming. Engage. We'll, we'll engage them some more. Okay. Um, I'd say I think it would have been helpful for this conversation. Um, you made a comment about needing 600 poles roughly to give equal access to all five providers. Um, this is not my background. To me, there's probably a point where the number of poles sounds silly. Where is that? Is 600 silly? Like it is. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. it is. Well, I, I wouldn't say it's silly. I'm sorry. I'd say it's the practicality would be a challenge because you'd have to find properties that would and property owners that would be willing to have all those facilities throughout the area. And so I, I don't know that it's really a practical solution, but, and, and really, I think what you would see is that the industry's not going to do that because they don't get, I think, I think it was a speaker that spoke in the public forum that talked about the economic viability of a site 
in some of these real rural areas or less populated areas, just they just won't go there uh, because it doesn't fit their financial pocketbook. But if you were to increase the height or open up some of these areas where they could go, they would be able to get a broader area covered. Uh, again, that, that 625 was just a number that our engineer sat down with, played around with it and said, you know what? If they ask you, this is what it would be. And so, but it wasn't something that we were necessarily, we're not promoting that. We just give you that information. Thanks. And my last and final question before we dig into it. You have one? Okay. Um, as the height increases, I'm not sure if there's maintenance concerns. For example, is there a feasibility where equipment can't reach that high to get someone in the air? Is that a concern as we look at heights? No. So the heights are unlimited in a sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. You have FAA regulations, <laughs> yeah. right? 200 feet, right? Sorry, there's FAA regulations, right? Oh, there is. Anything over 199.9 feet has to go through FAA approval and they have to be lit. But with regards to the question, can you go taller than that? You can. I'm oh. just answering the question. Uh, you, I've seen Christmas. very tall towers. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, I just have one, one question. So, and, and I appreciate all the data and obviously a lot of detail that you went uh, through here looking at all the regulations. I didn't see anything on, so I was wondering if you considered it, on setbacks and impacts to neighbors. So were there some analysis um, and evaluation on a certain type of facilities and the distance from neighbors or something that works better than others? You know, we heard today someone having a, you know, a hundred foot or 90 foot tower, 90 feet from their, from their property. And so just wondering if there was any consider, maybe that's a question for staff, not, not for the engineers. We did not ask them to, to look at those setbacks. Um, one of the things, and, and what we're trying to do is get your feedback here, and then we'll have to figure out what to do with that information. So for example, if you say that an existing facility could be raised X number of feet, what do we do then with the facilities that were originally built at that one to one foot setback, do they need a special exception? Or are they exempted from that? And we would then go back and try to get that information and bring that forward to you at a future date. Say, if you do this and you make it by right, there are, we think there are X number of sites that are going to impact uh, adjacent properties or not. You know, we'd have to figure that out, but um, we did not ask for that. Yeah, I, I do think that needs to be part of the, the equation here. So I think it's going to be as part of our deliberation. We can certainly touch on that. Thank you. All right, if there's no other specific questions to the presentation, we can jump right in and we can start with your topic if you want to. I might actually have one, oh. one last question real quick. If, if we didn't increase the height, but we increased the number of arrays and antenna size, how how... What's the coverage increase from from that without increasing the the height of the towers? It's not as much because it's, you've got so much distortion from the tree canopy, and it's it doesn't do a lot to raise it, or it doesn't. You would gain some. Let's see. I think he said. Uh, I'd have to. I have to go back. I don't remember. I know I asked the engineer that. Uh, but I'd be happy to ask him. I think it's it was the remote radio unit being up at the top that gave you more distance. You'd probably gain a little bit, but it wouldn't be nearly as much as increasing the um, getting the remote radio unit up there. So, okay, wait a minute. If I understand your question correctly, if you just change the configuration of what you allow from the slim line to the yard arm. I think he said you could increase it by 30%. I'm gonna have to look, I'm sorry. Can I get back to you on that? Sure, yeah, I mean, okay. it'd be Did nice I... to know what the coverage increase would be from doing all the changes that don't involve raising the height. Okay. Um, so I, I think that would be a useful thing to know is what that, that percentage would be roughly.
I think just to clarify, I think the, um, the co-location was essentially not tenable if we didn't increase the height because we use all that 10 feet for an array or a set of arrays uh, and anything below that would be blocked by trees. I mean, imagine, you know, these frequencies use essentially open air to transmit. Um, and so if you've got like a co-located provider below the tree line, it's not, they don't want that. All right. So as we, as we look at the questions here, they're on the screen, I'm, I'm kind of thinking of bundling them into three different topics and we can add to it as, as we want. But what I kind of see is avoidance areas, physical properties of, of the pole itself. And it may be setbacks as Commissioner Carrizana has, has shared setbacks and maybe even visuals. I haven't heard much about the visual piece to it. I've heard of a lot of engineering, but uh, not about the visual piece. So is there anything else? Well, yeah, I, I call it really a, the impacts to neighbors, so there could be a, a visual impact, it okay. could, you know, the, the, the tire were, were to fall, which I don't know what they, you know, the likelihood are of that, but I guess that's why you said that, that one to one, but it's, you know, that seems. The likelihood of failure is pretty low. Right. Uh, one of the things that is a factor and we do consider from time to time is actually ice fall as it builds up on, on the tower and then melts off, comes down in chunks. Does you all feel comfortable with those three buckets to mm -hmm. talk through? Sound reasonable? Okay. Well, maybe we should start with avoidance areas then. Uh, this question number one, initial thoughts and reactions to the question that's posed. Yes, Commissioner. I, I'd like to start. Um, first, just referencing mountaintops. Um, one of the things when this policy was created is before we had a biodiversity action plan, we weren't really considering the biodiversity aspect of this. Mountain type tops are very sensitive biological areas because they're cooler. They tend to be refuges from warming temperatures. As we consider a climate action plan, it we would do a big disservice to biodiversity to cover our mountain tops with antenna. So, so that's I, I would not be in favor of particularly the mountain top area changing that that policy. Um, and and also um, as a rural area resident. I just have to say generally, you know, I understand that part of the deal of living in a rural area is that you have less service. Um, and, and that's, I'm okay with that. It's just like when I go hiking in the wilderness, I don't expect my cell phone to work. I just don't. So I think that um, the primary use of the rural areas, it's important to remember is for conservation and agriculture, not residential use. Thank you for the comments. I'll push back on one part and you might think about being forced to live in a rural area because you can't afford to live in the developed area. So from an equity standpoint, I'll just, uh, I'll put that piece out there as well. But I do agree with, in general, perhaps. And I mean, I, I do live in the rural area. That's part of the consideration why I do live there is because I, I can afford to live there. But to your point. Yeah. Oh, great comments. Um, Commissioner Moore, like you were trying to speak. Um, <clears throat> You know, I do think when, when we limit ourselves and half the land of the county, essentially half, um, we can't put a tower on. Um, that does make for pretty constrained future uh, cell service. And when you go hiking in a wilderness or when you go hiking on a nice trail and, you know, your kid gets a sting or you have an allergic reaction or you fall and break your ankle, how are you going to get the word out? And so that's the kind of reason why I'm very in favor of uh, um as a, in principle, very in favor of better, broader coverage of, of cell service, um, as well as some of the other benefits that come with it too, but public safety is the first one. Um, you know, I know things like the towers on Carter's Mountain were, were grandfathered in, but I mean, you look up there and I know that the view shed is, personally, I don't mind towers, so I think they're kind of cool, but, um, but that's not the opinion of everybody here. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, but my point is just that, um, uh, I, I am in favor of exploring uh, some reduction or at least uh, easier ways to put uh, towers in those spaces to get proper coverage of, of the county. I, so to me, like like that first question, does the county desire to improve network coverage and capacity in some of these zones? My answer is yes. And, you know, less tempered yes than yours, perhaps. 
Sure, Claiborne, if I ask, may I ask a question? Sure. We're trying to absorb some of this. If I could ask uh, Commissioner Moore a, a follow-up question. <clears throat> the avoidance areas are not prohibited areas. Mm -hmm. uh, so they just add an extra layer of, of uh, regulation. Uh, I think the number is about 40% of the sites are actually in avoidance areas. And given that, does that change any of your comments? Uh, I'm still learning certain things about how many layers there are that go into that. Uh, I do think um, uh, on the whole, um, a goal that I bring to this is, is solid and robust public infrastructure for things like cell head coverage. Thank you. All right. Commissioners to this side, any thoughts, reactions? Yeah, I'll go. Sure. Um, all right. So just looking at the at the list in terms of avoidance areas, um, I'm, I'm actually do not have a problem, start that way, with ag forestal districts having towers um, because I don't think a tower is a use that interferes with someone running their tractor or their cows or their sheep grazing. Um, a lot of those areas, especially even the forest, you know, where active timbering is going on there, you know, there are other things they're working around there all the time and it would be the landowner's choice. No one's going to force a tower onto someone's farm. So I, I don't think that that is something that concerns me. Mountain, mountain protection areas does because that is actually, as you said, a sensitive landscape, but it's also extremely visible. Historic districts, I could kind of go either way on um, because it is a large swath of the county. And I think I would just say it depends. I'd have to look at the site and see if it was actually like in a really important iconic view shed of some historic structure or whether it was just somewhere on the property that of a large estate that happened to also be historic. So um, I guess that's, that's where I come down on the avoidance. And that was everything for avoidance, correct? I wrote a whole bunch of other things down here, but well, let's keep it to that. That's good. So to go back to our, our chair when he said it depends. And so I, I he <laughs> says to me, it, it does depend. Um, so the, so right now, if I read the first question, it's, it's almost like this blanket, okay, the tier two applications will now be you know made available. However, I do think that there are, there are considerations and so perhaps we need to think about that in terms of how does a tier two application um, impact a historic district? You know, where is it located? Mm -hmm. View sheds in the rural, I think, are important as well, and particularly in our in our entry corridors uh, and so forth. We actually we just put one in, in the middle of an entry corridor that's very visible mm -hmm. in a rural area, mm -hmm. and so perhaps we can allow them. I, I'm not opposed to allowing them for all the else reasons that have been stated, but they need to have some addition. So there, there wouldn't be the same as, as putting them in an in an area that is not restricted. Because that's, that's the way I would fall into that. There are still they would they should carry some requirements and 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 where they're located in those there may be some areas that are perfectly fine. And I'm sure there are. They're probably the majority of locations within these restrictor areas will probably be fine. But there are some they may not be, and I think uh, there still should be some some review and 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 some criteria put on those. Chair, sure, most of my comments are going to be around retrofitting. So if there's a pole there and we can get it higher to get a, a, to to increase the dispersion of that signal without having so that you're in fact not having to put another pole up, I'm always gonna say, yes, please do that. So everything we say there, mm -hmm. if we can get height, get dispersion, yes. Everyone knows that I, I wrestle with why some historic properties get the rule today, particularly from one of the historic properties, I can see a brand new healthcare facility that did not have to come into any kind of consideration with that historic property. So everyone knows that I have no tolerance for the historic property uh, card so when that gets played, that card. I do have, um, as uh, our newest member said, I do have some issues, and as you have said, Chair, I do have some issues about what we're saying to the places that are not the wealthy parts of our community. And so that swath of land sort of south of six and above Scottsville, or I guess the river, I guess it's the river there. The Ravana River, so that 
that below the below below twenty, below twenty above the river. And there's a whole host of people there. There's plain old work, working people. And there's a whole bunch of tradespeople over there that use their cell phones to get work to do work, to tell whomever is in their lives that they're going to be late or not going to be late. And so being able to fill in those areas where we have people who are making conscious decisions to remove themselves from sort of landlines for a whole host of reasons that I can share about some of that stuff if we get to one of these. So I, I'm, I'm not a, I am not opposed to ag forest. So this real, this real question is, do we push things to buy right? That's really what the tier two thing is. Do we push things to buy right? So I, I I do understand that there would be, I assume there'd be an overlay for interest quarters there. So even if it is a tier two, it has to go through some, I don't know, I'm asking that question. We, if it's in a tier two, would it have to go, and it's on a, an entrance quarter, would it have to go through a review about that? It, it all depends on how the regulations are, are written. If, if and that would be the one they should be protected, that, okay. then we, we protect them. If you think they should be exempted from review, they could be exempted. And that would be review. the one thing that I would suggest that if it was, a, if we were to to modify the 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 ag in the mountains, well, not so much the mountains, be the ags in the historic district, that if it sits in a, if it sits in a, a um, an entrance corridor, that it, that it not, not be able to opt out of that review. Right. Great. Sure. Uh, Mr. Fritz, I'm curious. Uh, I have one question on this topic here. Um, what kind of due diligence was done with comparable <laughs> areas? I think of a Winchester or the Shenandoah Valley. We're not the only ones grappling with this. What, what's kind of the findings, if you will, on similar areas? What are they doing? Um, I actually talk to a lot of other jurisdictions on a fairly regular basis about this topic. And some jurisdictions have taken an approach of they're very much hands off in terms of the regulation. Um, others are, uh, and, and some of those jurisdictions, you drive in those communities, you see the towers. And then there are some jurisdictions uh, that have very few regulations and they still don't have any coverage. And then some have some regulations and have to defend themselves in court um, uh, for denials. Fortunately, Admiral County has not had to do that very often. So we've looked at a lot of other jurisdictions and, and our ordinance was, is uh, one of the most detailed uh, and restrictive ordinances around. And I'm glad you brought up the point about potential legal exposure. I think that's something to be studied as well. Uh, we will always look at yeah. that and keep track of uh, how it complies with the um, Telecommunications Act and with the state code. Very well. Sure, sure. I, will, I will tell you, having d done some work up there, but if you look at Rappahannock County, they have they had quietly made a decision that they don't need cell towers for a whole host of reasons. Mm -hmm. They still have they still have the twenty acres without the mule, but the twenty acres and and the houses up there for for lot, for lot sizes. And then if you sort of run up from from Middleburg to to um oh what's the not the plains the plains get you from 64 but middleburg all the way up to to sort of paris to paris virginia again lot more historic homes there than we would even begin to be, begin to to sort of wrestle with here um they've also made some decisions about um close to middleburg so close to places where there are are, are there's lots of activity but not so much of a concern where it's just rolling hills. And part of that is homeowners of those grand estates aren't interested in selling, putting a tower on their property. So there is some, there is some, um, shall we sell market, market avoidance there. Understood. <laughs> Any other comments for the first bucket? And uh, staff feel like you've heard enough information for that very first helpful. bucket. Yes, very helpful. I just want to make a really quick okay. comment before I move on. I, I just want to bring up the comment that was already made by the public about the fact that um, a number of us now do have access to fiber through grants. It took three and a half years. I live in that very tiny end of the county where you saw nothing, the dead, mm -hmm. the giant dead zone. I knew that when I moved there. Uh, you know, and it's true that no tradesman can find my house. I tell them, please write a map, write it down before you leave, because once you're down there, you'll never have a cell connection. Um, but the residents do have use of their cell phones through that program, which was subsidized. So 
and this is being done in multiple areas in the county. Now it's not covering every area, but I just want us to not like let it appear to the public that there's these whole areas with no cell coverage. They do have cell coverage at their house. So, 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 so Chair, let me give the counterpoint to this piece right yeah. here. I was hoping that someone would do this. I live, <laughs> I, I live a mile off of Hydraulic Road. Okay? A mile off of Hydraulic Road. I have no cell coverage, none, zero. I also have spotty landline coverage. And I live a mile from Albemarle High School down the road. So, and I also live in a rural part of the community too. So I want to say it's not just folks who are in that swath there or the people who are up by Boonesville. That's mm -hmm. another area that it's almost impossible to get signals up there. But I just want to say that if you look at our map, our map really is about transportation lanes. We have great coverage along transportation lanes, which is how it was supposed to be, which was how it was initially to roll out. What we don't have good coverage, I think, is over the 27 years where people have migrated because of life, where people have come and they've built small communities like out in Earlysville on your way to Dyke or not necessarily Dyke, on the back way to Standardsville. There's a whole bunch of communities out there that are pretty lousy cell phone coverage. Yeah. Now, it wasn't their fault. They just moved out there and because there was a nice house out there. So I think what, what I'm hoping that we'll do here is try and align a policy and a desire with what the reality is where people live and what might come in the next sort of 10 to 15 years. Hopefully we don't take 10 to 15 years. Policy. And so there's some realignment of realignment of um, of of expectations. I live a mile away from Albemarle High School and I don't have cell phone coverage and I don't have it. And well, and I remember that. That's why I voted for the, the tower at the high I'll school yeah. that was also not obnoxious because it was co-located near a lot of tall light poles. Right. So it wasn't actually right. visual clutter. Yes. Um, but even looking at Route 20, it looked like there was all these towers. But when I leave my office in Scottsville every other Tuesday to come here, I have zero coverage from as soon as I leave Scottsville to when I get close to the city of Charlottesville, right. I, I am in dead the whole way. Must have so been were all my staff on multiple different networks. Oh, uh, it's because they must have been just a, all those polls are one provider only and it's not I yours. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I guess I just wanted to also push back slightly on, on some of this um, assumption that it, the, the people living in rural areas should just be fine with no or limited cell coverage. Like, like I don't know where that became like an understanding that that should be the way forever, you know? Uh, uh, and if we're, if we're living in 2023 and the 2030s and the 2040s, having the technology to support that and seeing it occasionally doesn't bother me. <laughs> um, my point. I, I think no one is saying that they shouldn't have it. I'm just saying that, that it's, not, it's not the necessity that we think it is. And I would also argue that as we expand more services to these rural areas, we also, part of the reason it is affordable to live in the rural areas is because of the lack of services. So people don't want to buy a house there because like I have no self coverage. Um, and so when you start providing those services to those rural areas, the home prices are also going to go up. And the demand to live in those areas for people who can telecommute and do other things, that goes up and so the demand goes up and they stop being affordable places to live. So. It's not as simple as we like that. <laughs> so I think Commissioner Carrizano wanted to say something. Who are you pointing at? Very okay. Quickly. And then we'll move on to the next bucket. Yeah, I think so, we I, that suggest yeah. we do go into the next bucket. And, and, and actually, I want to move into there. Yeah. I just I did want to echo uh, Commissioner Firehawk's point that, and I think this is what your your point. Well, at least the way I received it is. There is other technology and is the towers are not the only way that right. people are getting service. So there are there are some other uh, options out there. I can tell you from the west side of the county has improved dramatically that the access to to. Um, oh, yeah. It, it, so, yeah, there's other providers out there now that where you can get broadband and and so. So I'm sorry, near your situation, you, Bivens. but but, there, Nothing <laughs> but in fact, I think the Baseville area has benefited it does, uh, it has, quite, quite yeah, a bit. Yeah, from, yeah, so so there's fiber that's going to homes now, which it's going to be very reliable. Very, very good, very good. Um, so yeah, we can move into the physical characteristics. So I'm I'm actually not opposed to looking at raising heights. The same same as Commissioner Bivens, if we can avoid more and more and more poles, if 
the physical characteristics of, of the pole, although I, I, you know, I think the width and keeping that width all the way up may, you know, well, I'd probably think about that. Um, well, what is the optimal width that it needs up above, right? I mean, does it need to be 30 inches? Can be less. Um, but again, I think it's location. And if we can avoid certain areas like the inter corridors and view some view sheds, then why not? You know, why not have another 20 or 30 feet on it and be wider uh, if it's going to provide more, more coverage? So I do think there's a lot of latitude that we can begin to uh, consider here. A lot of it has to do with still keeping some view sheds and, and corridors uh, in mind. Yeah, I think I could agree with that too. I mean, I, I don't care if someone has a has a cell tower in the middle of their field, their farm field. I, is you know if it's but if it's if it's in their middle, of, it's right next to someone else's house on the side of that field. That's a different issue, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, or if it's a if they're placing in a sensitive ecological area, or you know, I think where these things are matter. If I could just and so when I say why not, um, I, I I would say this is where my earlier point of considering setbacks and and neighbors because yes i can have my field and put it there but am i putting it you know mm -hmm. really close to a, my neighbor who may not want it and so so i think considering setbacks as we think about more height more width um, more units devices okay. on it yeah. we do need to consider uh, what what the impact to the neighbors are as well yeah, that I think probably gets into the third bucket some, but um, but on the second bucket, I think I would agree with some of what's already been said as far as um, certainly more uh, arrays, like why we limit that to three doesn't, I, I don't know of a compelling reason that I've heard. Um, uh, increasing the, the, the size allowance slightly for the antennas so that we can push more out with fewer antennas, like that all makes a lot of sense to me. And then also having that that distance so that we can put the remote radio units and not have the signal loss and the coax going up. Yeah, that also makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so that's, I mean, just kind of the design and, and maybe slightly wider to accommodate it and all the rest. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Moore. Uh, we'll go Commissioner Bivens said something and then Commissioner Firehawk, you have something? Yeah, I have a bunch of chicken scratch here. Okay. I, I, I also, Chair, would agree with, with the um, the array size. And, and so I want to sort of part of this is technology moves on and how do we have policies and ordinance that sort of keep track with the policy as, it, as we, as we were, um, we were introduced to the, to the, to the presentation this evening, you saw bag phones to the really heavy, the heavy flip phones. No one had my favorite of Blackberry there, which would have been, which would have, I love my Blackberry. Uh, and to now everybody's, you know, the proverbial sort of Android or, or iOS mm -hmm. into whatever ever else comes out next, you know, it's sort of uh, uh, connected to, to the, to the, to the universe. Yeah, and, your head. yeah right. Yeah, oh no, that is, he is not getting in my head. No. We've had this conversation, <laughs> that is not happening. And so we also should have the sort of the nimbleness to be able to have our ordinances, particularly when it's this kind of public safety and economic development. Those two pieces that sort of come in there, public safety and economic development, to sort of be able to sort of say, yes, we need to be able to support. Still keeps is that still within the 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 um still within the sort of the vision for the county. So I, I'm for that. And particularly, and at some point I'll ask if we can think about is there a way to get bonus points. If the if it goes, this is for the next one. If it goes up higher and you co-locate, and I'm looking, you know, we have all these bonus things that you do with with development. But if you came in and said you get higher, and then you're so willing to co-locate, does that leave it into a into a tier one, or does that push something yeah, into a, a tier two? Because we're actually facilitating um, sort of co co-location. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I lost track of the buckets already. Um, so <laughs> just, I just kind of blended two and three. Uh, yeah, so is... that's what it felt like. So I'll just rattle through um, several points. Uh, so I'm also okay with it being taught above the tree line. Um, I wrote 20 feet as sort of a max comfort level. Um, I, I think it's a little strange the way our ordinance has the reference tree and it's above the X, you know, above the, because I was trying to think like a forestry site, like, if we put one in the middle of it and all the trees have been growing for 10 years, but they're all short, what's the reference tree? You know, so 
I, you could do, I, I suggest, <laughs> and, and just a little fact to the average tree height in Virginia is 67 feet. Like now you can be fun at pot cocktail parties. But <laughs> point being that um, I think you might want to look at like how high is the, the tallest reference tree likely to grow. There are, there's a great database of Virginia Tech on tree widths and heights. And um, you could, you could probably project so that you wouldn't end up, you know, because trees keep growing and keep doing that. Um, then I also think that we could allow the arrays to project out farther. Uh, how many times has uh, Ms. Schweller been before us asking for six inch difference in, in a projection at the top in, on a pole that is what? How many feet up in the air? You can't tell six. It's like, you know that game you did when you were five? You were like, I'm crushing your head. Like, you would be like, you can't tell that. So I, I think that, that we should go ahead and, and she's come before us for at least four or five years saying the technology has changed. May I please have permission for my client to move six inches wider um, away from the pole. So I have no problem with that. And, and I sympathize with, and she's written long memos on why this is the case. I can forward you guys um, if you don't still have them. Um, and then I also really would like to see encouraging co-location. I liked your idea of giving some kind of bonus or incentive for it um, so that we could get several arrays. I also um, like the, I, this was mentioned by the uh, consultant and I'm gonna butcher this, but I think it was the JMA unit or something. It was 20 square inches too big. Okay, let's increase whatever that description is so that we can stop this and maybe make it even a little bit bigger. So like somebody builds something that's three inches larger and now ordinances can't, can't accommodate it. Uh, a minor point, I, oh, I also wanna say the taper area to me seems silly. Once you are so many feet up in the air, again, my crushing your head analogy, I cannot tell the difference at 80 feet off the ground or whatever it is that, that a pole is this wide versus this wide. It, it just, it's already up there. Um, I, I, and I, I also think a lot of the uh, concealments, uh, putting a brown pole against a white sky is not really concealment. So I've often advocated up here for going with a silver or something that blends with the sky. Very minor point, and I'll end with this because I think I got everything. Um, the fake trees are no good. The fake, I have seen them and the boughs, it's, they blow off in the wind. And I don't know whose job it is to go around and stick more plastic branches back in the fake tree, but apparently no one's because I've seen these even in our county at the Department of Forestry missing tons of those branches and look like heck. Uh, the other thing is I've seen them in New England where they're even really ridiculous. You drive along in Massachusetts, there's a line of pine trees and there's one fake pine tree that is three times taller. It, does, it would be much better if it was a silver pole if they're going to do that. It looks absurd and it's a terrible eyesore. So just forget the fig trees and I'll end on that somewhat silly note. But I really am in support of maximizing once you're going to build a tower, you're going to drive a road in, you're going to disturb some area to put it up. You're going to have a maintenance facility. Once you've done all that disturbance, why not just kind of maximize what you've done there rather than disturbing many, many, many more areas across the county? And I think uh, to Okay. Uh, just to kind of, uh, since we're blending two and three a little bit, I think uh, Commissioner Carzano is very good to bring up um, the setbacks. And I think that is maybe a bit different from some of the other things I've said is uh, I do really agree with the spirit of what you're saying. It's like, if we're going to have towers. Let's have them work well and cover the space, the land that we can, but also have them. And I'm very sympathetic to what some of the public has said here uh, in terms of, you know, having a large tower from me to the end of this auditorium would be not ideal. Um, so I do think setbacks, there's there's something to be said about uh, how we study that and, and formulate ways to make that work better for people. Yeah. It sounds like we are reaching a pretty good consensus. I'll kind of reiterate what I think I'm hearing. Um, less is more in terms of towers. <clears throat> sounds like we're okay with going higher, but location matters. Um, we're not just going to turn a blind eye to it. It's not going to be a blanket policy, but we prefer there's some checks and balances, if you will. Uh, particularly with setbacks and visuals. Um, I do want to touch on that notion of property value. We hadn't touched on it here, but is there any data that correlates before and after property values? I feel like that comes up in almost every public hearing. Is there any data out there that tracks that 
I'll give the answer based on the information I've I have and and Susan can okay. add any information. We've not seen any information that gives a direct correlation between relationship to towers and, and property values. All right. Chair, Chair could I could I add something? So we, we they started off with a sort of a private partner, private public partnership. Mm -hmm. And so there is a piece that I would like us or like staff to give some consideration, yeah. perhaps the supervisors. All of our parks are in rural areas. So when they open up Biscuit Run, and then there's okay. the there's my favorite park that I love to say it because it's so way out there and you got to drive there for a while. That's the Patricia and Byron Park. Mm -hmm. It also allows horses. So you were talking about I talking think, that one that's right up against the mountain. The, it's right on the. You mountain. have to walk. Straight uh, up. You straight straight up. Yes. And so these are places that the county has identified as amenities. And my piece would be is that the county needs to make sure that if it's designated as a location for people to go, that if something goes wrong, you can call and get help there. Oh, safety. You know, and so that I really, if you haven't been to the Patricia Ann Byron Park, you should go. I've been. It's lovely, but it is way up there near Boonesville. And um, it's, you know, it's hard to call someone from there to say, can you come help me because my car won't start? Because the bear well, ate my lunch. Going back to public safety, all right. So, any other commissioner want to add anything before I check with staff to see if they're okay? I guess just a slight pushback. I, I don't subscribe to the notion that every park should have cell coverage necessarily. That's not um, that's not a reason to necessarily have cell coverage somewhere. So, there are a lot of um, uh, arguments one could make for getting away from the sound of someone chattering on a cell phone while going down a trail. Okay, so we have various points on that one. Um, do you have what you need, Mr. Fritz? Very helpful. I will let you know that um, <laughs> we don't know the next steps of what we're going to do other than we do have a public outreach that we're going to do. We're not quite sure what form that's going to take, uh, but we are going to do it. And then ultimately there will be public hearings with both the planning commission and board of supervisors. I also wanna let anybody who's here or listening online know that we will take this presentation, put it online and uh, try to get some mapping information so people can can see that um, a little easier than maybe they did here. Um, but we, we are maintaining that site. So if a draft is developed of a draft ordinance, I think it would be helpful if that draft ordinance comes to us before it's distributed to the public. We would not, we may prepare concepts as we're talking with the public to say, what if it said, take some of the things that you said about setbacks and start, start the crafting work, but it may not be in the actual form of an ordinance. Um, but we would, we, what we do is we keep trying to refine it more and more and more. That's the direction that the board has given us to keep refining it more and more and more so that people can provide comments along the way as it's getting more and more refined until ultimately um, we, you would have the ordinance at the planning commission meeting for the public hearing. But wouldn't, it, it may be ordinance-esque, but more an organization. We we have to give people something to, to see and That's choose right. on. <laughs> that makes sense. I like that ordinance. All right. All right, with that, I'm going to call for a seven-minute recess before we go into the... Yeah, you remember that, right? <laughs> before we go into the public hearing, so we'll take a recess. Seven. Unless you're trying to take seven minutes. <laughs> Is the staff, is a baby? You were ready approved this one. Okay. Ready? All right.
All right. Welcome back from our commercial break. <laughs> we are now ready for the public hearing. So SP 2022-00032, the Miller School of Albemarle. With that, I'll ask for the staff report. Thank you. Um, good evening, commissioners. I'm Rebecca Ragsdale, and I am a planner with the planning division, and I'll be taking us through the county analysis um, before we turn it over to the applicant. I'm going to give a brief presentation and orient you to the site and the request. <clears throat> the property uh, is over a thousand acres uh, with frontage on Miller School Road, Dick Woods Road, Birches Creek, and Pounding Creek Road. Um, the primary entrances um, we'll go over in a minute as far as those, but those aren't changing. Um, it is zoned rural areas and is surrounded by rural area zoned property. It's also surrounded by a number of con conservation easements. The property itself is under easement, as well as um, some agricultural and forestal districts and is nearby the Batesville or adjacent to the Batesville Historic District. There are some um, significant um, water resources with the Meachams River running through the property, um, along with Miller Branch and some tributary streams. As you can see, the majority of it is forested and there are um, critical slopes on the site as well. This is um, an exhibit provided by the applicant. The green indicates the forested areas. Um, the pale yellowish greenish color indicates um, the development envelopes um, and the, the one that's circled in yellow with the dashed yellow circle is the um, main campus area that we'll be focusing on this evening. But this shows you some of the site characteristics and the location of um, the water resources. Um, Miller School Road actually runs through um, the property. And as I said, the entrances are circled and they won't be changing with this proposal. Um, the campus is oriented um, north to south um, and there are campus um, envelopes identified in the conservation easement. So they're sticking to that and we'll go over that in a minute. There are also some other areas um, that are defined by the conservation easement. Um, the school was, is obviously historic established in 1878 and is on um, the register with um, three uh, significant structures identified uh, as far as Old Main, um, Caton Hall, and the headmaster's house. Um, the use obviously predates zoning, so it's been operating as a legally non-conforming use, which limits um, major expansions or planning for the future. Um, so they've gone through that master planning exercise um, to determine what their current needs are. And they've indicated that the existing enrollment is about 230 students, and there are boarding students and um, day students as well. There was the prior special use permit request, but that request is a little bit different. Um, that had a limited, requested fewer students and included um, additions to structures, whereas this has been, the, the plan for the, for the site has been rethought. <clears throat> and we're gonna go over the current proposal now which is a request for up to 500 students. Um, this envelope is about a hundred acre portion of the site, I believe. Um, and to orient you again, we've pivoted from north is now to the right. Uh, so you can see the linear fashion better as far as where the new buildings are proposed. The future buildings are shown in blue on the screen. And there are some areas planned for possible future parking and potential drain field and stormwater strategies. Um, they'll probably go over this in more detail, but they do have a detailed phasing plan that they've thought through um, and they would expect to incrementally make these changes, but the request is for up to 500 students ultimately. And that's what we have analyzed. And that would be an increase in enrollment, but also expanding the grades to elementary grades. Um, the this plan has been reviewed by all of our typical reviewers and they didn't have any objections. Um, we did note that there are some labeling updates. Technically speaking, we don't have steep slopes in the rural areas. We have critical slopes. They've indicated that there wouldn't be any disturbance. They need to do more um, field run topo 
So we'll get a more accurate depiction of slopes at the site plan phase. <clears throat> also, things to come at the site plan phase would be um, detailed stormwater management and um, potentially we're we're imagining this would require a central system approval by the Board of Supervisors, but that certainly hasn't been designed at this point, but that would be another future action that's necessary that we wanted to um, to mention. Uh, they again, they've done a lot of um, illustrative work and master planning. Um, so this is um, one of their illustrations for the proposed campus with the existing buildings on the left and then continuing down excuse me, on the right, and then continuing down um, with the grade to add existing buildings um, and recreational areas and parking. Um, we analyzed this request based on the criteria that's in the ordinance, um, and those are looking at any detriment to abutting properties, if the character of the area would be changed, um, is the use in harmony with other uses in the district, in the rural area zoning district, and then is there would there be any harm to public health and safety or where, welfare that we sh should be a, concerned about, and of course consistency with the comprehensive plan. I mentioned that we didn't have any safety concerns. Um, the applicant did provide some trip generation information that was reviewed by VDOT and our transportation planning staff, and that was primarily the questions we got at the community meeting. Um, was having more information about traffic and traffic management. And they have provided those figures for day-to-day -day operations, but also they have, um, they've been managing events or any additional traffic um, that isn't expected at peak hour times um, for the campus. Um, so we didn't find any, any concerns with regard to any of those things. As we showed you on the maps, the campus area is in interior to the site and they're sort of just doing an extension of that in areas that are sort of already been um, disturbed. So we wouldn't expect any any detriment or any change in character to either abutting pro properties, but also it's being done in a way that's compatible with um, existing historic resources. Um, we listed these strategies in the comp plan from the comp plan in the staff report. There are a number of them that the Miller School property is already um, meeting or exceeding, if you will, in some cases, as far as um, conservation easement on the property and all of the resources that are protected. Um, there are not any additions proposed to historic resources, um, but they are, so, <clears throat> excuse me, and they're obviously designing the campus plan in a way that doesn't cause any detriment to resources. It was reviewed by our historic preservation staff, as well as representatives at the Virginia Department of Historic Resources and they didn't note any concerns. Um, and our staff, our historic resources staff are also here this evening if you have any um, specific detailed questions that I <clears throat> would not be able to answer. Um, so these are um, our factors, favorable and unfavorable as we used to call them, but we've noted the positive aspects to um, this project and it will um, bring the site into compliance and. Um, that will make it easier for us to answer and administer any any questions or any any proposals that they might have going forward, and then also provides them the flexibility they need for their future planning. We um, have a concept plan that we are um, happy with in terms of the development being limited, and of course the rest of the property is under easement, and it does support the continuation of the historic private um, school and protects, um, meets many of the elements, excuse me, recommendations of the comprehensive plan with regard to conservation and historic resources. Typically, um, you know, we, we're not encouraging new private schools in the rural areas because they increases development in the rural areas, but this of course is already existing and been in continuous operation. And so we support the request. Um, we did again, get the comments about uh, trip generation figures, but we um, have not found that there's any um, safety concern or level of service concern. So that led us to our recommended recommendation of approval, and we included um, we included three conditions. Um, 
which unfortunately I'm not sure why this slide doesn't have the third. Um, but there is um, the typical condition about um, development in accord with the plan. And we have revised these conditions to combine two since your staff report. Um, and condition number two, um, after discussion with the applicant, it provides um, some flexibility in terms of the fluctuation that may happen as they approach maximum enrollment with the number of residential students, but we feel like the 40% um, minimum at maximum um, capacity or enrollment addresses um, traffic and reduces trips, and that was part of the, the traffic analysis. Um, so with that, I will answer any questions and we'll um, double check the conditions whenever we get to the point for motions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ragsdale. Council. I, I can clarify the conditions right now. They, the conditions actually, if Mr. Agsdale, if you go back a screen, and this is probably what Mr. McDermott just told you, that the second paragraph, the minor modifications, appears in your staff report as condition two, and then what's numbered on the screen as condition two is actually a consolidation in the staff report of conditions three and four. So all the substance of what you see on the screen is identical to what's in the staff report. It's just numbered differently. Thank, Thank you. you. I was second guessing myself. <laughs> Don't do it. All right. Uh, any questions for staff? I have a question for the county attorney. As a former, oh, can you use your mic? Thank you. As a former student of of the Miller School, are there any conflict of interest um, <laughs> considerations that I need to be aware of? Not unless you have a financial interest in the school. All right. Well, if there's no questions for staff, we can open a public hearing and I'll call for the applicant. Would you like to make another report or presentation? Welcome to our meeting. We look forward to, to hearing what you have. I believe you will have 10 minutes. It's been a long time since I've said this. Uh, 10 minutes and I would be green. And uh, as your time winds down, probably about the two minute mark roughly will turn to yellow. Uh, so we just ask that you make your most pertinent points that you hadn't already made, and then red means stop, and we look forward to what you have. So the well, floor you. is yours. Thank you, and good evening, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. And I didn't realize you were an alum, so wonderful to meet you. Um, I'd like to thank Rebecca and Kevin as well for their work on our behalf, uh, putting together that wonderful presentation. My name is Mike Drude. I'm the head of school of the Miller School of Albemarle. I'm also a proud parent of two Miller graduates. Uh, our daughter, Lily, uh, graduated in 2020 and is going to be a senior at JMU uh, this coming fall uh, as a psychology major. And our, our son, Matthew, uh, graduated in 2018 and he's already graduated JMU and he's up in the DC area, gainfully employed and living and working and finally off of our payroll. So we're very happy to, happy for that. Our founder, Sammy Miller, had a vision for a school that would provide students with a uh, what was truly an education ahead of its time. He believed schools could be used to improve people's lives. And Miller originally, the original curriculum included in, intentional programming that focused not only on academics, but also on health, career choices, and life skills. Miller introduced a cross-curricular approach to education weaving together traditional curricular subjects with real life topics such as sewing, gardening, electrical engineering. In fact, students would spend half their day in the classroom in a traditional setting, and the rest of the day would be spent in the fields, in the gardens, in the metal shop, or the powerhouse. Our curriculum has significantly changed over 145 years, but we continue to honor Mr. Miller's vision by providing a student-centered approach to education with plenty of hands-on, project-based, real-life, learning-by-doing experiences. And in order for us to continue to do this, like any healthy organization, we need to grow. And we have a plan uh, for healthy and careful growth over the next several years. Now, since our school is uh, so old, we predate the zoning ordinances and things like special use permits. It's time for us to conform to the important and well-designed zoning laws of Albemarle County and help us move forward. Uh, this process uh, to obtain a special use permit uh, has been a good one and very helpful. We operate under a strategic plan that was put into place years ago, and it takes into account things like modest growth, 
carefully planned new facilities for our students, upgrades to the campus safety plan, improved traffic flow and parking, and certainly the protection of our school's mission of educating our students' minds, hands, and hearts. And working with the, the planning team and our local uh, consultants here, right here from Charlottesville, um, this process has forced us to revisit our plan, to test our assumptions, to ask important questions. And this was a really good thing to do because it has validated our vision and has made our plan stronger. We're really proud to present the plan to you guys tonight. I've read that uh, Samuel Miller was fond of uh, students who took advantage of opportunities. And this SUP is a great opportunity for Miller. It's a great opportunity for to further our mission of minds, hands, and hearts for kids from Albemarle, Charlottesville, across the country, and actually across the world. It's a great opportunity for our 80 plus teachers and staff members uh, for providing them with an exciting opportunity to work at a mission-based and value-driven institution. And it's a great opportunity for Miller to become even stronger partners with all of you as we grow and deliver our mission to more and more kids. So I appreciate this process. I look forward to hopefully a lot of questions tonight that we can answer for you. And at this point, I'd love uh, for Daniel Heyer, our consultant to come to the podium and provide more details of this plan. Daniel. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to quickly open. Let's hope the computer works. Doesn't seem like it's working. So, <laughs> we have some <laughs> IT assistance. Oh, there it goes. Okay, it's working. Maybe they did something. Let's see. All right, we got progress. All right, there we go. Nicole, you make it go full screen. <laughs> yes, thank you. Let's see. Wow. You can just you can just imagine that it's full screen, or someone smarter than me can fix it. Look at that. Thank you. Most important person. <laughs> okay. Well, Rebecca did a great job introducing um, the project. Mike has done a great job introducing the institution. Uh, my name's Daniel. I'll try to fill in maybe some of the technical insights and some of our work related to this request. And I'll try to be brief. Um, this is a brief outline of what I'll be talking about, our request, our proposal, and then the conditions, which actually Rebecca covered. So I didn't know she would. So great. Um, to reiterate what Mike said, we're looking to bring this, this campus into conformance with the current um, zoning ordinance. And so... Um, it's apropos that the Samuel Miller, this Miller School is in the Samuel Miller District on Samuel on Miller School Road. So very rooted in the community. Um, obviously, you do have context now. We're in Western Albemarle. And for the purposes of this presentation, we will be rotating our view to north is to your right. And um, one of our tasks through this process was to show how the Miller School actually can grow to 500 students and how it can do it responsibly. And so as Mike mentioned, as Bob Pinio, our architect, has done great work in, in helping establish this, this, these next two slides simply try to reinforce how we will do that. Um, step one is to, to do some renovation work on the girls' dormitory building, uh, shown in the uh, number one bubble there. Um, and doing that work will also begin to work towards strengthening the pedestrian corridors, which is um, to establish those thoroughfares for students to move and planning for their movement over the long term. Um, at the same time, also working to delineate vehicular corridors and vehicular areas. Um, the first new construction project that we propose is to build a boys dormitory shown in item four on the screen. And that was really the project that necessitated the special use permit. We can't build that, that project without having our special use permit in place. Once that building is built, the boys will relocate to that dormitory building and they will move out of Old Main, which is where they're currently residing. Um, and that dovetails nicely with why we've asked that condition to be reworded with the 40% occupancy. There's some juggling that's going to happen over the, the years that come with um, space and, and um, residential areas. And then uh, once the boys have moved into their new dorm, 
Old Main can then um, be renovated to um, return it back to just classrooms, which right now it's kind of a multi-purpose building. Um, the basement would be renovated. And then um, as the school does grow, which that's our intent, uh, the runway, the long runway of growth toward 500, which is close to doubling the school, um, more dormitories would be built. And then as those, those uh, students begin to attend, the athletic facilities and the recreational spaces will likewise grow. So that's a very quick version of, of how the growth toward 500 students will happen. And here's, once again, your um, conceptual site plan with envelopes of buildings and parking and such. Um, to spend a few minutes addressing impacts, um, you know, the environmental impacts that we can talk a lot about that, but I think the school has done a very responsible job of hemming themselves in with the responsible conservation easement and all of the work that we've proposed on that previous slide falls within the, the building envelope windows as specified by their conservation easement, um, which protects all the resources that Rebecca mentioned. Um, and talking about public resources, I think the thing I've learned and come to learn the most um, strongly is that the Miller School is a public resource in and of itself. It's a huge resource to the county and to many of the former students and to the citizens who, you know, bike on their trails, so on and so forth. And then um, a very, always a touchy subject is traffic. Um, we've actually done more than just trip generation calculations. We did a relatively robust safety analysis on the roadway itself, looking at all the crash data we had between 2015 and 2021. Um, we have some interesting trends we've noticed, or actually the lack of trends that we've noticed. Um, almost all, all of the accidents, except for two, were single vehicle accidents. They all happened at night. They um, either happened with um, you know, wet conditions or with an animal. Some were um, inebriated drivers. So um, if you want to talk more about traffic, I'd be happy to dive into that. But we did a robust safety analysis of the roadway. We did look at trip generations and applied relatively conservative factors to that. Um, no turn lane warrants were justified. No right or left-hand turn lane warrants were justified. Even in our worst conditions, we could, we could predict or try to justify. Um, I can talk more about that if anyone's interested. Rebecca already um, took care of this. I didn't know that she would. So we were going to recommend that conditions three and four be combined so that the school has a little bit of flexibility with as they get to 500, that's really the, the, where the thresholds of, of residents, students versus um, you know, students who drive, arrive in a car every day. So that delineation becomes more important. Um, so that's it, actually. I've got a uh, few more secret slides after this one that might help answer questions, but in terms of our presentation, that is it. Very well, thank you. Uh, questions for the applicant? Sure, I see that um, you're using the, the old lily pond um, for stormwater is that that was not there. Have you considered your, um, your previous entrance, there's a, a moan depression right by your previous entrance that I've for years, crossing that think it should be a biofilter so something you might consider if you haven't already to, to think about converting that into a biofilter it's you know right between the school and, and the river so yeah no, that's a great suggestion i think ultimately um stormwater quantity will be handled at the lily pond as much as possible but water quality can be handled in features like what you mentioned we have to satisfy both with our work so definitely be thinking of that thank you any other questions? Commissioner Moore? No? Questions from this side? A quick sure. question. Just wanted, to, oops, just wanted to clarify on you, the proffers. Were you, were you asking, I, I think in originally the staff had worded that you would, um, the residential status would be 40% uh, and you had but it, in the staff thing, it said in any academic year or something right. like that. And you just want it to say like overall versus like a year by year standard. Is that what you were asking for? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then uh, I was just thinking when you were talking about a bio swale and you're talking about stormwater, uh, we need more engineers in this world. And so anything you can do for STEM education, um, think about the fact that 
Albemarle County, when they put in, they had a stormwater facility there and a big, uh, big uh, constructed wetland. They, they incorporated that into the curriculum. The students monitored the water quality. They looked at the wildlife and the insects using the site, the plant structure. So um, that could interest somebody in sure. the fields of landscape design, landscape architecture, stormwater engineering. So don't think of them just as a necessary stormwater thing you have to do, but perhaps uh, learning opportunity measurements such. That has nothing to do with your application. I just got excited by that idea. It has everything to do with the application. It's an important part of it. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I, I, I run a tech firm, so I, I need you to produce some more tech people. <laughs> All right. We'd That's like to produce thing. 500 of them, I think. <laughs> <laughs> there, there were even some grants used those locally. Um, I believe like Crozet Elementary, for example, used a grant from the um, Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries that was geared towards um, stormwater management and education. Specifically, it was for, for schools to provide stormwater management and educate students about you know, wildlife and ecology. So, mm, yeah, this is an amazing opportunity for stuff like that. Interesting. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you for the presentation. I'll, sure. I'll turn to the public to see if there's any comments from the public. So, comments from those here in person on this matter. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Clerk, is there anyone online? No, there is not. Okay. All right. Well, with that, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing. <laughs> I'm not sure they would be responding to, but do you, would you like to make any any last minute comments for a close the public hearing? All right. I'll close the public hearing. All right. So I'll bring it back into the commission. Uh, initial thoughts and reactions. I have a question, Chair. Sure. Quick a question, a, qu a clarification in the question. Is this for council or? Well, uh, this is for staff, and I'm sure that that our council will give <laughs> me a look over the uh, over the monitor that would help me. There. So a number of times, people said that this coming before the planning commission now will bring the Miller School into conformity, of which I don't understand how a special use permit changes the fundamental ordinance that says there should not be schools in the rural area. So I think what we're still doing is doing a special use permit to have a school there. So the current configuration of the school is presumably a legal non-conforming use. For them to expand that use is what requires a special use permit. If they were to keep the school in its current condition, current configuration, current size, and so forth, it could presumably continue as a legal non-conforming use. It's the expansion that brings it to you tonight. So we're gonna so we will then have both a non-conforming and then a conforming with the special use permit. I'm working, I'm, I, I know I'm, I'm working on jargon here, but I'm trying to figure out how does the special use permit convert a, convert a place that is non-conforming now into conforming? It, it's, um, it, it, will, it will not be both. It will, it will now be caught up to current zoning. We use the term private school. We require special use permits for private schools. So it, it will no longer be non-conforming. It will now be conforming because, because of the special of, use yes it, in though. the sense that it will it will comply with the current county standards which before it it may or may not have but wasn't required wasn't to. required to okay so this is a bit of you know that's this a, a worthwhile question yeah this is a bit of a hand waving here because i'm saying okay this over here from the 1860s or 1870s you weren't this over here and uh, let's see when this probably goes this is 23 so it'll be 25 in 2025 you will and all of a sudden you're all good I'm okay with that. I just want to be clear that that's what we're doing. That you know we're bringing and we're bringing a construction forward into conformity that hasn't been since the 1870s. Well, well, going going. I'm sorry. Going forward, there won't be a distinction between sort of the old school and the new school. It will all be uh, built pursuant to the special use permit, and so therefore, it need not sort of take advantage of the legal non-conforming status going forward. Okay. It that that makes me feel it. much better. If, if approved. All right. Commissioner Moore, do you have? Okay. Other thoughts, reactions? 
questions for staff? I'm just, I'm, I'm writing okay. a condition. <laughs> okay. With that, it seems like there's nothing else to add. Are you, are you ready to I think so, yeah. Okay. I was just trying to write down what I said okay. instead of talk off the top of my head. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure you'll appreciate it, perhaps. All right. Um, I move to recommend, a, I just want to say a quick comment. The reason I didn't ask a lot of com comments to the schools, I did attend the public meeting. I've been to the school multiple times. So all my questions are answered at that time. It's not that I'm just uh, flippant about this expansion of use. And I will also say that most of the site is actually protected and very well buffered from the neighbors. So it's also not the case that any private school coming to us wanting to expand in the rural area is just no problem. So I just... They have their each site's unique, which is the whole point of this analysis. So with that, I move to recommend approval of SB 20220032 with the conditions as presented by staff with the following change, delete in any academic year and replace with the total of 40% at full enrollment. I think that requires some slight wordsmithing because I... Is that yeah, already done? done? All right. You just said, look how fast it is. <laughs> uh, uh, Commissioner Firehawk, is that consistent with what you're seeing yes. on the screen right now? Or are, are you are you moving that? Uh, that yes, I just want to make sure it didn't say in any academic year, because it did in the staff report. If, if so, if the if the conditions on the screen are acceptable to you, then I suppose the motion would be to move approval with the conditions shown on the screen, as you just said. <laughs> so moved. Is there a second? Second. All right. Any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, Mr. Clerk, could you call the roll? Mr. Moore? Aye. Ms. Farhawk? Oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't recognize that. Right. Yeah, me. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Mr. Carazana? Aye. Mr. Bivens? Aye. Mr. Murray? Aye. Mr. Claiborne? Aye. All right, looks like the motion passes unanimously. So, with that, um, you didn't hear a whole lot, but take what you did here, and we wish you the best of luck as you move forward. So, thank you. All right, we'll move on to committee reports. Does any commissioner have a report they'd like to share? Commissioner Bivens. Well, I, I just have, I, I was at a um, Places 29 Hydraulic Community Advisory mm -hmm. Committee last night, and I would like to recommend, Chair, that we have Greg Harper who is over, who's the um, Albemarle County Environmental Services, and his group deals with stormwater. And last night, I heard a bunch of information in that in the seven years of me being on our, our, um, on our committee, I didn't understand how it all worked together. You know, we see it at this front end, and then he's seeing it at, at the end after things are being constructed. And I think it would just be interesting as we're thinking about um, ordinances, to hear from Mr. Harper so he can bring us up to date about and inform us about how storm water is handled in a in a sort of macro level uh, for the county. And I saw also at a micro level, but more so a holistic level, I should say that. That sounds interesting. I'll, I'll ask that we put that as a topic floating under new business and I'll ask staff to continue to follow that and see if we can work it into our docket. So thank you, Commissioner Bivens. Any other commissioners with the report? Yes, I attended a um, another community meeting about the Oak Bluff development. Oak Bluff, okay. And, right, in Crozet. Yeah, Crozet. Yeah. Um, and um, it was a very well attended community meeting. Um, still a, a lot of um, concern from the residents there about that development and the, the density that's being proposed there. Um, and um, particularly a lot of concerns about um, the the current level of infrastructure in that that area, um, you know, I think particularly um, in terms of some traffic that, that's occurring there. It you know, and we hear about traffic concerns. You know, and it's easy to it's easy to not give those the attention that they concern. But you know, but one of the things that was mentioned there, for example, was a a child that was at a bus stop and their their cat. Um, ran into the road in front of them and they they went out to try and grab the cat. Um, but luckily one of the parents pulled the kid back because then a car came and ran the cat over right in front of the child. 
Um, and I tell you this horrible story, not to distress you, but just to say, when we talk about traffic and infrastructure, it really does matter, you know? And so when people are, you know, concerned about a, a new development next to them and, and the impacts of that, and, and you know, it, it, is, it is something we need to think about. So I imagine we're gonna be hearing a lot more about that development. Um, that's all I got. Thank, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Commissioner Carazano? Well, I, I'll just follow that. <laughs> I, I, I was at an AC44 meeting last night and uh, in Murray Elementary, and much of the topic was around Crozet, even, even though it's, it's an IV, it's, you know, but it's fairly close to Crozet, and it was about just a, and, and that development came up. Um, cat. Not the cat oh, oh. development oh. <laughs> named Crozet. Um, and the traffic, so what it was actually well attended as well. I I was there for about half the time, but um, I think there was at least one person in here that was there probably the <laughs> whole time. I'm assuming the stream of people kept coming in. Yes, it was well attended. We thought for the as far as the um, events have been. Yeah, yeah. So I, I thought it was you know there was it was well staffed. So I think there was enough people there to answer questions of as. Um, residents came came through but traffic uh, particularly in the growth of Crozet was a a constant I, I theme in the evening I I thought it raised some important questions for me about how do we how do we responsibly fund infrastructure and get that infrastructure ahead so that when you do have a proposed development like that 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 people aren't concerned of a failing level of service Hear that all the time. Yeah. Uh, any other updates? All right. Well, we move to the next item, which is a review of the Board of Supervisors meeting from the June seventh uh, gathering. So, Mr. McDermott. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chairman Claiborne, um, the uh, meeting we had uh, last week with the Board of Supervisors had one public hearing that. Um, you all had already seen it was the Misty Mountain Campground Special Use Permit to expand that that campground out there in Western Albemarle. Uh, it was a um, I'll, I'll first say that uh, following the PC meeting, they did make a bunch of changes to that application, uh, including things about the fencing and moving the um, moving the. Uh, the, the bathroom, the bathhouse further away. Uh, so, so took a lot of your comments under advisement. Of course, you all had approved that 6-0. Uh, with the Board of Supervisors, a, a much tighter, much uh, more nuanced conversation. It did end up passing uh, with a 3-2 vote. There was one supervisor absent. Um, mainly, I, I think a, a few of the issues, one of the big concerns was all about the uh, existing campsites in the floodplain, if you remember that discussion as part of it. And then also just um, impacts to the neighbors, including from all the additional campfire smoke, things like that. But in the end, they did decide to approve that 3-2. Um, and then the only other item that was uh, that you all have had discussions about also was they had a work session on solar. Essentially, it was the same work session that you had seen uh, a number of months back presented. They did give the information to the board about your comments. Um, and now they're back looking at all that information and, and we'll be coming back with uh, uh, some proposed ordinance stuff in the future. Mr. McDermott, I'm curious that our comments resonate with the board regarding the solar project, or is there any groundbreaking news from the board that we should be aware of? No, there was no groundbreaking news, and, and the information was presented in the report that this responses that you all had given to the various questions they have was just given a report, so they didn't really get into a lot of detail. Thank you. Can I ask a super yeah, quick question? Absolutely. Do do we have estimate? I'm sorry, do we have estimate for when we might get the solar ordinance? Uh I do not know, but I can take a look I, and I get back can't to you. wait for it. I'm mm -hmm. so excited. Now, there are other localities also who know that we are working on this and they can't wait either because they would like to see what we do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know the exact timeline on that, but I will I will okay. send an email. In general to you all. <laughs> is fine. I'm not gonna hold you to a day. <laughs> 
Any other questions for Mr. McDermott? Yeah, we, sure. I've received an um, emailed question about the water protection ordinance. And and I was wondering when I know that staff are working on a revision to the water protection ordinance. Do you have any news on that and when that will be coming before us? I don't have a timeline on that either, but I can get something for you and, and send it by email following the meeting. Okay. All right. We'll move on to a uh, new business and I'll give it back to Mr. McDermott for the AC44 update. Yeah. Um, as Commissioner Carzano mentioned, we did have our... Um, our final public meeting on uh, the uh, the toolkits was happened yesterday. That was the final of four public meetings that we had. Um, so got a lot of really good feedback. We're assembling that information right now. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, in addition, right now we have our uh, open house chat kits available, and this is a working group issue. So the working group, we worked with them to come up with a way to go out to various places in the community and uh, assess, and, and these are activity centers or places where they frequent like to go, uh, assess the things about that activity center that make it a place for them to want to go and do a little report on that and give that information back to us. So the working group right now is out working on that information uh, and, and that'll be collected in the next uh, month or so. Um, and, and we're hoping to hit, get that back mm -hmm. right in time for the next uh, the next commissioner peace um, planning commission work session, which is ha happening at the end of July. I think it's July 27th. I believe for 25th, right around there. Um, se second meeting in July. Uh, and we'll be presenting on all the feedback that we've heard through all of this on the activity centers um, to get, you know, so to let the commissioners know where we are and what we've heard and get your feedback on all of that information. Um, so those are the next steps where we are. Can you say something or I a comment? But you can okay. Go. Um, I'll just share that first. Thank you. And I think um, there's a secret that the process is certainly moving quickly. And so I think one of the things that we'll do as a commission, right, is to break apart some of those topics and maybe it requires more work sessions, but to provide a chance to have more richer conversation um, on some of these topics as they're moving forward. So I do want to put that plug out there as well to make sure our commissioners are all on the same page. But yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I did send an email to everyone and it basically just expressed my uh, displeasure with the amount of vetting that we're having with some of these topics before they're going out to the public. And there are some topics that really do require, I believe, a fuller discussion by this body before we ask the public what they think. And growth area expansion is, in my mind, this is just my opinion, I'm not speaking for everyone here, one of the hottest topics in our county, just about besides affordable housing and a couple other things. So I've, you know, I looked at the criteria of evaluating when, you know, from the AC44 process, I looked at the, all of the materials. I looked at them all before I wrote that email. And I, I believe it's my opinion. These are not criteria. They're very vague and poorly worded and, and raise alarm that we are not giving due diligence to consideration. Now, I'm not casting aspersions on any staff that staff are flipping about this topic or, hey, whatever, what do you all think? But I do believe that we should have had more robust conversation here. And I want to also note that informing the planning commission, like, hey, we're going out to the public with this, is not the same as a robust discussion where we agree that we think these are the right things to present to the public. Uh, so that's that's kind of my piece. I don't need to get into more detail now, but I've I've spoken with our chair uh, before this just before this evening, and uh, he has assured me that uh, there's going to be more dialogue with staff about what are those topics. I also want to make another point in that was covered in uh, staff's response to me, and I think it was to to reassure me, but it actually did the opposite, and that was about having more two on two meetings. Now, I know when we first started this process, we had these, and these are to avoid having a public hearing and have a longer discussion. 
you you can decide what the reason is, but uh, you know, two of the commissioners met with the consultants and we and staff and we talked about just general thoughts about the comp plan and whatever we wanted to talk about before the process started. Um, but I want to do the rest of those conversations in public. Uh, so I'm not going to participate in any more two on two conversations about the comp plan. Everything I have to say about the comp plan, I'm going to say in the public. So that's that's just where I come from. You all can choose to do what you like, but I I feel like sometimes there's been an impression like the consultant firm, we told the commission. Now we're telling the public. But the public is communicating back to me, and I'm not going to name names of the public at this time, but there are some influential folks in our county saying, did the planning commission review these and agree to this as this is what the framework is you want to put out there, specifically on the growth area expansion? And I and I asked at the last meeting, are we uh, being asked for our input at this time on these criteria? And the answer from the consultants was no. And it is in the minutes if you care to read it. So with that, um, I think that we should be more careful, um, even at a conversation that this commission had, maybe it was a, I don't know how many months ago, and a year ago, uh, where we just talked about the growth area just generally, and an alert went out from an activist group saying, commission this, uh, plans to expand the growth area. Uh, so, so we have to be careful. Uh, and again, not attributing any nefarious intent to anyone, to just to say that there are some topics that really we can't just kind of put out there and say, what do y'all think? So, so, so that's me, that's so where I'm coming let from. Let me come up, let me shade the 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 advocates in the community. If I were to say that the walls were red here tonight, mm -hmm. it would come into the community that I said the walls were red, even if they are, even if they were red. And, and 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 so and so, give you, so so when we started this whole process, I was on the task force one, and it was very clear on the task force one that there were a number of people who had both feet and feet in in Albemarle County and in the city, and the person kept referring to, um, there's a group of people who are really watching what you're doing. Of which my response was, they can watch all they want. I sure. really, I only, you know, I don't need any new friends. <laughs> and, and it was said in that kind of, it was said in that kind of line, so that so that people will take the positions that they feel as if they need to advance. And I'm happy for them to do that. In fact, I'm very happy to do that. I am not going to use that pos their their positioning or their language to shade how I do what I want to do in this role. Right. Okay, so I want to be real clear about that. Sure. So that, that frankly, the people who said that the planning commission was either going to ex going to increase the development area or going to reduce the the, the development area forgets as eliminated one important element. We recommend things to the supervisors. The supervisors in this jurisdiction sure. have the last vote on anything that becomes a comp plan. And I think what we do, and certainly what I what I will say we do, having a rigorous discussion like you're like you're leading us into here is in essence what we need to do. Yes. But what I will also say, as as I there are times when I would like to think more freely. Yes. And I don't want that done in public because people miss people misquote me every time I do that. So when I'm thinking about can I do this? Sometimes I want to be, I want staff to say ordinance can't be written that way. And and have that as a way that when we come here, then we have a rigorous conversation. Because I am not, I I am not a um my day job is not what you what, what four of you on this committee do. My day job is something completely different. So sometimes I'm just trying to sort of think out something. And the way we do public, the way we do public meetings. It's hard to do that sometimes for a non-professional. Well, I, I would just like to say, I want us, I, you are totally welcome to do any other kind of meetings in the county that you want, obviously. And I would never want you to shy away from speaking your mind. I've never seen you do it yet. <laughs> um, and, and myself, you know, nobody has been like emailing me and threatening me or anything like that. I just want to be clear. <laughs> um, but they've been asking me, you know, what was the level of vetting that, that occurred here? Um, I I would like to be able to also have work sessions where we can explore ideas and have my mind changes up here all the time, believe it or not. 
And I like to, you know, I, I know, like, for example, I'll just pick on Commissioner Murray. He and I have like a couple of things where we like just touched on them and we're like, well, we should talk about that more. But we haven't finished our conversation. So I would like to have that conversation about this, that, and the next topic with the rest of you too. Um, so, so there's a whole, there's a list of things. That, and, and I think Mr. Claiborne, you probably even <laughs> could recite that list if you had off the top of your head, those, what those things are, because we brought them up time and again, and we've been asking staff, when can we have that conversation about X, Y, Z later, later, later. And so, uh, yeah, that's all I wanted to say about that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say anything more about it again tonight. Um, but I, I really feel strongly that there are some things that we need to be really careful about how much our input is is given before things go to a different space. Yeah, so. yeah. And, and I'll just back that up. I mean, out of all the planning decisions that we could weigh in on, expansion of the growth areas is the most significant planning decision <laughs> out there. And so... I too was troubled that that a draft, you know, proposal, you know, like this was was circulated that wasn't vetted by us, and and it seemed like there was a lot of the comments that that we had made when they they did come to us they didn't really get incorporated in, in here, um, and that I think if we had been able to weigh in on this before it had been released, we could have had some valuable in, input that would have been useful to the public. I, I think. One, I'll say there's definitely a general consensus within the commission. I don't think that's fractured in any way. I will say the, the things that stand out to me is how we define engagement, right? So clearly the wires are crossed and defining engagement with our consultants. So staff will have that conversation with them. I think we also need to look at the entire schedule. And it might mean we have to have more work sessions. I think we're all okay with that. Is what I'm hearing. We're all okay with that, right? And so it's, with that being said, it's looking at the scope and the breadth of what we want to talk about and making sure it appropriately reflects the agenda, right? So that we shouldn't have topics that probably require three hours of discussion crammed into a 90 minute. minutes. Yeah. Right. And so we're all talking through that and we're going to make those course corrections. So, all right. Thank you. All right. Well, staff, would you like to add anything else to the comment? Uh, nope. I just look forward to the meeting next month where we can, where we can talk about these items. That's right. That's right. And thank you staff for all the support as well. Shepherding a very aggressive schedule and a, a large scope of work. So, um, any new items, but well, that was that the new item. I, I have one there. new item. Okay. This is a very exciting for me. This is June 22nd, the Southern Albemarle convenience center. Ta-da! We'll finally open. I will be there with all my recycling and cheering for the county folks who are doing the official opening. There's also a soft opening a few days before where to make sure that the bins are working or people aren't confused. But anyway, if you want to have a good time, 10 a.m., June 22nd, bring your recycling in Keene by the post office. Any other new business or items to follow up? No. Well, with that, is there a motion to adjourn until Tuesday, June 27th, 2023? No moved. All right. Is there a second? A second. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, this meeting is adjourned. Mm -hmm.